I was strolling on the moon one day in a merry, merry month of December. Now, May, May, when I'm much to my surprise, a pair of bunny eyes. All engines are started. We have ignition. Two, one, zero. We have a liftoff. We have a liftoff, and it's lighting up the area. It's just like daylight here at Kennedy Space Center as the Saturn V is moving off the pad. It has now cleared the tower. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control. We're at T-minus one hour, 22 minutes, and counting. The cabin purge has now been completed, and the boost protective cover has been closed. The 65% nitrogen, 35% oxygen mixture will now be enriched to a 60-40 mixture at liftoff. Just completed were some pre-flight command tests with the Manned Spacecraft Center in Houston. These tests are to ensure that Houston can send commands and that they are being received on the, by the launch vehicle. Also just completed was a first motion signal. This is the first motion of the vehicle as it lifts off the pad. A test signal was sent to the Eastern Test Range and to the Manned Spacecraft Center in Houston to assure that they will get this signal at liftoff. Also, we just received a final go for the Jim Spear release. The Jim Spear is a weather balloon, which uh, is the final weather balloon to go up before launch, indicating the wind direction. C-band beacons are in check at this time. The C-band beacons aboard the launch vehicle are used in tracking. They give indications of uh, range, velocity, uh, during the powered phase of flight. The cue ball sim command was just sent. The cue ball is an angle of attack meter, which is perched above the launch escape system, and it's read by the spacecraft commander in the spacecraft. It would indicate any deviation from the planned flight route. It reads zero as it sits on the pad, and during the test, a simulated command is sent to it, and uh, Gene Cernan in the spacecraft reads off what he is reading in the spacecraft during that sim command. The checks in the spacecraft continue to run somewhat ahead of schedule. The spacecraft test conductor, Skip Chauvin, indicated they're running ahead and looking good, to which Cernan replied, we're looking good up here, too. The countdown continuing to move along well at this time. T-minus one hour, 21 minutes and counting. This is Kennedy Launch Control.
This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control. We're T-minus one hour, 12 minutes, and counting. At this time, spacecraft commander Gene Cernan and the spacecraft test conductor Skip Chauvin are going over some command checks. During these checks, the uh, spacecraft commander actually gimbals the, or moves, swings the main engine in the service module. He does this using his flight hand controller, and this is a system uh, which is done so that if there is a problem with a computer which normally flies these, he could take over and manually fly it. Normally, however, all burns of this engine are done uh, by the computer. Out at the pad, the space vehicle is surrounded by searchlights producing some 225 foot candles of light. A total of 72 20 kilowatt xenon lights and two 60 kilowatt xenon searchlight banks provide this illumination. At liftoff, approximately 7,500 foot candles will be produced from the flame of the Saturn V first stage engines. This is almost equivalent to daylight. Searchlights will also illuminate the Apollo 17 for the first 60 feet of its flight. Our countdown continuing to go smoothly now as we approach the one hour mark. T minus one hour, 11 minutes and counting. This is Kennedy Launch Control.
Okay. Go ahead. This is this is Apollo Saturn launch control. We're T minus one hour and counting. T minus one hour and counting. Just completed were the C band beacon checks. These are checks of the beacon, two of them aboard the instrument unit of the space vehicle. These are used in conjunction with C band radar here at Kennedy Space Center to check the uh, space vehicle during the powered phase of flight. Check was just made with the superintendent of range operations who ran through the camera coverage, uh, looking at the weather around the various areas to see what camera coverage, and that appears to be satisfactory. Meanwhile, at the pad, the closeout crew has completed securing the white room area, and they are clearing the pad area themselves at this time. Just before they left, they indicated to Cernan uh, they were completed their job going back uh, away from the pad area. Cernan said, we'll see you when we get back. The pad leader responded that the next face you see better be a frogman or you're in trouble. Weather appears to be satisfactory. We've been tracking some local buildups, but at this time there it is, they do not seem to be posing any problem for an on-time launch at 9.53 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Now T-minus 59 minutes, 32 seconds and counting. This is Kennedy Launch Control. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control. We're at T-minus 55 minutes, 54 seconds, and counting. Stoney, astronaut Bob Parker, the capsule communicator here in the firing room, who has a variety of functions during this mission, one of which is to set the elevators at the 320-foot level. He actually commands the elevators, which are part of the egress system, emergency egress system, for the astronauts. He has just reported that the elevators have now been set at the 320-foot level. In an emergency, the crew could come out of their spacecraft, enter these elevators where they would be lowered at a high speed, 600 feet per minute, to the ground floor or A-level floor where they can exit from there into uh, a variety of escape modes, one of which would be down a chute into a blast danger uh, area or a safety area 
or they could uh, continue on out and be picked up by armored carriers. Under uh, way at this time with the launch vehicle are some checks of the secure range safety systems aboard the vehicle. These are actually checks of the receivers in that system. A range safety officer could terminate the flight of Apollo 17 if it became erratic by initiating the emergency cutoff or, if necessary, a propellant dispersion command. These systems are located on each of the flight stages or three stages of the Saturn V, two receivers in each stage, and they would receive a signal from the range safety officers and then sending through them, through these receivers, uh, they could perform the propellant dispersion. These actions, of course, would be taken only if the vehicle were so erratic that were, it were endangering some land areas, and of course, only after the crew had used one of the escape options open to them. Test going well at this time. Our countdown continuing, T minus 54 minutes, six seconds and counting. This is Kennedy Launch Control. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control, T-minus 50 minutes, 55 seconds, and counting. Preparations are underway in the Launch Control Center at this time for a critical power transfer test. The space vehicle at this time is being fed from an external power source, but shortly before liftoff, it will be transferred to the internal flight batteries. This test is to ensure that all electrical systems aboard the vehicle function properly on the internal flight batteries. The test takes about five minutes, during which time the various elements of the launch team monitor their systems and report in then to the test supervisor, Bill Schick, here in the control room, that everything looks good during the test. 
Depending on local weather conditions in various areas around the United States, the flight of Apollo 17 will be monitored or be able to be seen by people as far as 500 miles away. This is the flight uh, as seen of the first stage of powered flight. This would include a large portion of the southeastern United States, northern tip of Cuba, and the Bahama Islands. The power transfer test now underway. First stage, second stage, third stage, instrument unit now all going to internal power. Countdown continu continuing to go well. T minus 49 minutes, 35 seconds and counting. This is Kennedy Test Control. Apollo Saturn launch control. We're now T-minus 45 minutes, 55 seconds and counting. Various elements of the launch team reporting into test supervisor Bill Schick that they experienced no problems during the power transfer. We've now transferred back again to an external power source which will feed the vehicle systems until approximately 50 seconds before liftoff, at which time the final power transfer to internal takes place. At the T-minus 45 minute mark, we'll be watching for swing arm number nine. That's the swing arm that gives access to the spacecraft 
uh, to swing back to a retract position 12 degrees back from the spacecraft. This is a park position, a standby position, where it will remain down till the final moments of the countdown. T minus five minutes, it swings back to the full retract position. Once it swings back, the launch escape system aboard the, uh, the top of the spacecraft can be armed, and this system could be used to pull the astronaut crew to safety in any uh, disaster. Now, T minus 44 minutes, 52 seconds and counting. This is Kennedy Launch Control. This is Apollo Saturn. This is Apollo Saturn launch control. We're T minus 40 minutes, 51 seconds, and counting. Swing arm number nine just retracted a few minutes ago. As it retracted, the astronaut crew aboard the space field could feel it moving away from the spacecraft. Eugene Cernan, spacecraft commander, commented, we're really hanging out here in the breeze now. 
spacecraft test conductor uh, referring to the weather indicated that that was just a small breeze. The launch escape system has been armed. This system now could be used to carry the astronauts to safety if necessary. It's also used during the initial phases of powered flight to carry the astronauts away in an emergency. It would fly away in a high arc, pulling them to a height uh, enough so that their parachute system could deploy and they could make a normal landing. The system is about 33 feet long. The motor develops 147,000 pounds of thrust. This is almost twice the amount of thrust of the Redstone rocket, which powered astronaut Alan Shepard, America's first man into space. The countdown continuing to move along smoothly now, T-minus 39 minutes, 36 seconds and counting. This is Kennedy Launch Control.
Aegis, Apollo Saturn Launch Control. We're T-minus 35 minutes, 11 seconds, and counting. Spacecraft Commander Gene Cernan just reported back to the spacecraft test conductor, Skip Chauvin. He said, you've delivered us the best, now it's our turn. Thank the guys, we want to see them as soon as we can, as we can when we get back, and I guarantee you, we'll do that. Meanwhile, C-band beacon checks are going on with the uh, space vehicle, the liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen fully aboard and being replenished at this time to ensure a full load at liftoff. The countdown continuing to go smoothly as we approach the half hour mark, T-minus 34 minutes, 34 seconds and counting. This is Kennedy Launch Control. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control, T-minus 30 minutes, 54 seconds, and counting. Manned spacecraft just indicated to the test supervisor, Bill Schick, that we are go for the terminal countdown sequences. Final propulsion checks have been completed, and the C-band readouts, uh, once again repeated, have been completed. Beach Boss reports the launch site recovery force helicopters are on station and ready. Digital range safety command checks are now underway as the countdown continues smoothly, aiming for the T-minus 30-minute mark. Now T-minus 30 minutes, 24 seconds and counting. This is Kennedy Launch Control.
Right. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control, T minus 25 minutes, 54 seconds and counting. Command Module Pilot Ron Evans at this time has armed the reaction control system aboard the service module. He does this by allowing the hypergolic fuels to move down the lines to the engines. At this time, he's reading out the temperatures, pressures, and fuel quantities in that system. Our weather continues to look good. The major frontal area, which had been of some concern earlier, has remained well west, well west of the uh, launch area. Also, some smaller buildups, which we have been monitoring, do not appear to be coming close enough to cause any concern for our 9.53 p.m. launch time. That launch will be aiming Apollo 17 for the Taurus Litro area of the moon. This area named after the Taurus Mountains, these in southern Turkey, and the Austrian astronomer Litro. The site is expected to yield some of the oldest and some of the youngest lunar samples returned during the Apollo, Apollo flights to the moon. Now T-minus 24 minutes, 50 seconds and counting. This is Kennedy Launch Control.
This Apollo Saturn launch control, T minus 20 minutes, 55 seconds and counting. A short time from now, we'll begin chilling the propulsion systems aboard the second and third stage of the Saturn V vehicle. This is necessary to condition them for the flow of the super cold liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen. Just a few moments ago, the crew aboard the Spacecraft America was given an updated weather forecast. Cernan reported, I hope it's as beautiful out there as it is in here. Countdown continuing to move smoothly at T-minus 20 minutes, 24 seconds and counting. This is Kennedy Launch Control.
This is Apollo. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control. T minus 15 minutes, 52 seconds, and counting. The Vice President of the United States, Spiro Agnew, has entered the Launch Control Center now. He'll observe the final portions of the countdown from here and also the launch. Arming and checking of the service module reaction control system has now been completed and in progress is the chill down of the S2 or second stage start tanks. Checkout's continuing to go well, some running a little bit ahead of schedule, uh, all on time. T minus 15 minutes, 20 seconds and counting. This is Kennedy Test Control.
This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control, T minus 10 minutes, 55 seconds and counting. This time some computer checks being run with the launch vehicle. The spacecraft has now gone to full internal power. Up to this point, the spacecraft fuel cells have been sharing the power load with an external source. Also going on at this time are some, are some checks of the Astrocom circuit. This is the circuit which is used by the launch operations manager, spacecraft test conductor, Stoney, and the three astronauts at launch time. This to ensure that they are not getting any extraneous voices or having to listen to any of the other networks uh, which might be carrying on conversations uh, which they don't need at that time. Countdown proceeding smoothly, T minus 10 minutes, 15 seconds and counting. This is Kennedy Launch Control. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control, T minus eight minutes and counting. T minus eight minutes and counting. The Vice President in the firing room at launch at the Launch Control Center, observing the final minutes of the countdown, and he'll watch the launch from here. The countdown has proceeded smoothly, picking up at 11:53 a.m. this morning. Our weather continues to look good as we aim toward a 9:53 p.m. Eastern Standard Time launch. Now, T minus seven minutes, 37 seconds, and counting. This is Kennedy Launch Control.
This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control, T minus five minutes, 54 seconds and counting. At this time, entering the final phases of the countdown, various elements of the team reporting into test supervisor Bill Schick with their go, no goes for launch. At launch time, a water deluge system at the pad will spray water over the entire area of the pad, some 400,000 gallons of water, more than an average family would use in three years, will be spread over the pad and the swing arms, protecting them from the searing flames of the Saturn V first stage. Various elements reporting in now. First stage reporting they are go. Range safety, superintendent of range operations, they are go. Launch operations manager reports he is go for launch. Launch director Walter Caprian has given a go for launch. We passed the five minute mark, T minus four minutes, 55 seconds and counting, and swing arm number nine now coming back to the fully retracted position. The launch escape system sitting atop the uh, spacecraft, spacecraft named America by the crew, now could pull the crew to safety if there were any problems while the vehicle remains on the pad or during the early portions of the flight. At the T-minus uh, four-minute mark, we'll be standing by for a word from the launch vehicle test conductor, Norm Carlson, giving a clear for launch for the launch vehicle ignition. At T-minus three minutes, seven seconds, we'll go on an automatic sequencer. It's called the terminal countdown sequencer. The astronauts on the Astrocom circuit now reporting and thanking the launch team for all their prayers and all their help. T-minus three minutes, 55 seconds and counting. Apollo 17, the launch team wishes you good luck and Godspeed, reports the launch operations manager over the Astrocom circuit. T-minus three minutes, 40 seconds. The countdown continuing to go along smoothly. Once we go on the terminal countdown sequencer, the count will be automatic from there on out. The countdown sequencer will initiate the various functions from that time on. However, the men here in the firing room will be monitoring their consoles, watching temperatures, pressures, various readouts. They could override that terminal sequencer if necessary. Moving up now to the time when we'll go on that terminal sequencer, T minus three minutes, 10 seconds, and counting. Spacecraft ready light has come on, indicating that the spacecraft is ready. We are now on the terminal sequencer. Launch sequence has started. Roger, three minutes, Bob. Flowing of that water on the pad will begin at the one minute mark. Four, Flowing on the flame three. deflector below the launch vehicle, on the launch pedestal itself, and along the swing arms, which will be coming back at liftoff. Instrument unit ready light has come on. Emergency detection system ready light is on. All indications are we are go for launch as we approach the two minute, 30 second mark. Pressurization of the various uh, propellant tanks now aboard the space vehicle is starting. S2 or second stage liquid oxygen tanks now pressurized. These propellant tanks are pressurized with helium to ensure that during the flight the uh, fuel flows properly down through the engines. It's quiet here in the firing room now as the men are monitoring their consoles, looking at the temperatures, uh, checking pressures, and a variety of parameters to ensure everything is in a go condition. Roger, two minutes. Pressurization, pressurization continuing on the fuel tanks at this time. We'll go to the critical power transfer at the T-minus 50-second mark in the countdown. At that time, we'll transfer external power source to the flight batteries aboard the space vehicle. The final action by the crew aboard the spacecraft America will be a final guidance alignment that is conducted by the spacecraft commander, Gene Cernan. The flight of Apollo 17 will be able to be seen depending on weather conditions some 500 miles away as it uh, goes into Earth orbit. Pressurization continuing, liquid hydrogen tanks now aboard the second stage have been pressurized, all propellants aboard the second stage now pressurized. A cover aboard the cue ball, this is the cue ball system on top of the uh, 
Launch escape system will be pulled off just shortly before launch. First stage propellant tanks have been pressurized. Now past the one minute mark and we are going on internal power. Now all systems to internal power. We'll be looking for the engine start sequence at the 8.9 second mark in the countdown. The engines will build up to a thrust of 7.6 million pounds. T minus 30 seconds. We have a cutoff. We have a cutoff at T minus 30 seconds. We're standing by at T minus 30 second mark. We'll bring word to you uh, just as soon as we get it. We have a cutoff at T minus 30 seconds. T minus 30 seconds and holding. This is Kennedy Launch Control. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control. We're holding at the 30-second mark. This was an automatic cutoff, cut off by the terminal sequencer. As mentioned, this sequencer initiates various actions. Each action must take place and must be completed before the next one can be initiated. If anything does not get completed in time, there will be an automatic cutoff. This cutoff was automatic, done by the sequencer. We're standing by now to check just what the problem was. Now, T minus 30 seconds and holding. This is Kennedy Launch Control. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control, the astronaut crew aboard the spacecraft going through their various safing now, safing of all systems, and the launch team here continuing through their emergency procedures. We'll be standing by to check, uh, check out the problem just as soon as we can get word. T-minus 30 seconds and holding. This is Kennedy Launch Control.
Roger, going off and then auto. AC. AC. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control. The safing procedure is continuing at this time up to the T-minus 30-second mark. The countdown had been proceeding smoothly. Weather conditions at launch were predicted to be and appeared to be good at that time. However, we had an automatic cutoff from the terminal countdown sequencer, and we're standing by to see just what caused that automatic cutoff. All systems being safe at this time. T-minus 30 seconds, and we are in a hold. This is Kennedy Launch Control.
This Apollo, this Apollo Saturn launch control. We're continuing in our hold at the 30-second mark while the launch team assesses our problem. Uh, the swing arm, swing arm number nine, will be brought back to its park position, which is uh, 12 degrees back from the space vehicle. Continuing uh, the safing procedures this time and assessing the problem, holding at uh, T minus 30 seconds. This is Kennedy launch control. This is Apollo Saturn launch control. We're continuing our hold at the T-minus 30-second mark as the launch team assesses our problem. At this time, swing arm number nine is going back uh, to the 12-degree park position. This is in a position about uh, 15 to 20 feet from the spacecraft. All safing procedures have uh, proceeded normally. We're continuing our hold while we assess the problem at T-minus 30 seconds. This is Kennedy launch control. This Apollo Saturn launch control, the swing arm number nine, is now back to that retract uh, position at the 12 degree position. Okay. Point out that the window we have tonight extends to 1.31 a.m. So we have some time here to assess the problem uh, and then continue, recycle and continue our countdown. We're continuing to hold at the 30 second mark at this time. T minus 30 seconds and holding. This is Kennedy launch control. This Apollo Saturn launch control, we're at T-minus 30 seconds and continuing our hold. The problem was with the terminal countdown sequencer, which failed to give the command to pressurize, pressurize the third stage LOX tank. Uh, the crew in the firing room, uh, realizing this or seeing this happen, pressurized the tank manually, but this did not happen fast enough to satisfy the, the automatic sequencer. As was mentioned earlier during this sequence, everything must happen at a certain time before the next step in the sequence can take place. The next step that was to take place was the retraction of swing arm nine, and at the time that was to take place, the terminal sequencer had not had an indication that the third stage lock tanks had been pressurized. The plan now is to recycle to the T-minus 22 minute mark in the countdown. Now this recycling procedure will take an additional 35 to 40 minutes. This still puts us well within our launch window. While we're recycling, we'll continue to review the data to determine just what the problem is and whether or not we can proceed from the T-minus 22 minute mark uh, for a, a launch later in the window. The crew aboard the spacecraft has been alerted to the problem and understand what is happening. They're standing by there at this time. Now T-minus 30 seconds and holding. This is Kennedy Launch Control.
This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control. We're remaining still in the T-minus 30-second mark. We'll remain here for some period. It will take approximately 35 to 40 minutes to recycle back to T-minus 22 minutes, where we'll resume the count. To explain again, what had happened was we were in what was called the terminal countdown sequencer. At three minutes, seven seconds in the countdown, we go on to an automatic system called a terminal countdown sequencer. This countdown sequencer initi initiates various actions, the final actions in the count. Each of these must occur on schedule and in sequence. Now, what happened at this particular time was the third stage liquid oxygen tank was not automatically pressurized as it should have been. The launch crew here in the firing room, when they saw this, manually pressurized that system, but it was too late to satisfy the sequencer. The next event in the sequence was the retraction of swing arm number one, swing arm going over to the first stage, and at that time, the sequencer did not see that the tank had been pressurized and sent an automatic cutoff. So we had an automatic cutoff at the 30-second mark. We're standing by at the 30-second mark to uh, go back to T-minus 22 minutes, and we are reevaluating the, the problem, looking at uh, what caused the sequencer not to automatically pressurize that tank seeing what that problem is and seeing if there's a possibility if we go ahead and do this manually early in the sequence if that will satisfy the sequencer and we can proceed. Now holding at the T-minus 30 second mark in our countdown, this is Kennedy Launch Control. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control. We're continuing to stand by here at the T-minus 30 second mark in the countdown. The crew remaining perfectly calm in their spacecraft. They've gone through their safing checks. The various safing checks of the launch vehicle have been completed. We're now going through preparations for recycling to the T-minus 22-minute mark. Standing by at this time at T-minus 30 seconds. T-minus 30 seconds and holding in the countdown for Apollo 17. This is Kennedy Launch Control. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control. We're continuing our hold at the 30-second mark. We'll recycle to the T-minus 22-minute mark. The T-minus 22-minute mark is uh, chosen as the recycling point because this is a point where we start the chill-down, as was mentioned during that point in the countdown. We start the chill-down of the second and third stages to prepare them for the influx of the liquid hydrogen, the cold liquid hydrogen, and the cold liquid oxygen. This chill down has some very sp specific parameters and must be started at a certain time and cannot go beyond a certain time. So it's best to go back to that point in the countdown under these circumstances and resume our count at the T-minus 22 minute mark uh, when a determination is made that we can resume. Continuing to look at the data here to see exactly what happened. There is no indication of Ignition. Ignition was scheduled to come at the 8.9 second mark. Here in the control room, a number of the people were looking through the remote uh, cameras, which have the capability uh, out at the pad of zooming in on specific areas, and a number of people here were looking right at those first stage engines, and there was no indication whatsoever of engine ignition. We're continuing to evaluate all the data at this time as we hold at the T-minus 30 second mark. This is Kennedy Launch Control. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control, still in our hold at the 30-second mark. While the launch team here is busy recycling to the T-minus 22-minute mark, the mission team out at the Manned Spacecraft Center also pre-planning some of the new uh, times for the mission. They're also uh, this time busily pre-planning the new launch azimuth the azimuth uh, now, if we go at the next opportunity, would be 81.06 degrees. This will be automatically fed into the instrument unit of the Saturn V vehicle from the manned spacecraft center. All elements of the launch team now putting everything together, checking over data, and doing their best to uh, put us back into a recycle position, ready to pick up the count at the T-minus 2, 22-minute mark. Still evaluate, evaluating data, however, and we have not at this time been given a go for that uh, resuming of the count. T-minus 30 seconds and holding at this time. This is Kennedy Launch Control.
This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control, continuing our hold at the 32nd mark. Back to the Mission Control Center in Houston. The flight controller is returning to their seats now after some consultations. They're back now giving a status check uh, and uh, getting ready in case we are. Uh, it is determined that we can pick up the count. In the firing room here, the Apollo Program Director Rocco Patron has moved into the viewing area where the President, or the Vice President Spiro Agnew and NASA Administrator James Fletcher are and he's giving them a briefing and a rundown on our problem. We're standing by at this time. The clock has now been recycled to the T minus 22 minute mark. However, we have not picked up the count at that uh, mark, but we are now at T minus 22 minutes and holding. This is Kennedy Launch Control. Apollo Saturn Launch Control. We're continuing to stand by at the T-minus 22-minute mark in the countdown. Recycling operations have gone well. We're back at the T-minus 22-minute mark, and it's at this mark which we would pick up the count if we are given a go to resume. A check has been made of the Mission Control Center team. It's Mission Control Center in Houston. All elements of that team reporting that uh, they are ready to resume as soon as they get the word. Now standing by here at Kennedy Space Center while data is reviewed, and determination will be made if and when we can resume our countdown for Apollo 17. Now, T-minus 22 minutes and holding. This is Kennedy Launch Control. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control. We're continuing to stand by at the T-minus 22 minute mark. We're hoping to resume the count shortly. The problem has not been resolved. We're continuing to look into it. However, it has been determined that uh, a resolution one way or the other should be able to be made shortly. So right now we are continuing our recycle procedures, hoping to pick up the count uh, perhaps just minutes from now. If the problem is not resolved by the time we reach the T-minus eight minute mark, if, after we continue to count down, the clock will be, hold, will be held again. Right now, we're uh, continuing the recycling procedures, hoping to pick up shortly at T-minus 22 minutes. We're now T-minus 22 minutes and holding. This is Kennedy Launch Control. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control. We're continuing to stand by at the T-minus 22 minute mark. We've been given the word here in the firing room now that the count will be resumed at 11 p.m. at T-minus 22 minutes. At this time, there has still not been a resolution to the problem, but we'll continue looking at that. We could uh, continue on counting down while this problem has look, is looked at. To uh, reiterate what the problem was, the terminal countdown sequencer failed to give the command to pressurize the third stage liquid oxygen tanks. The crews monitoring this function saw that that happened and immediately manually pressurized the tanks, but this did not occur in time in the sequence and when swing arm one was to retract, it had not received this signal. As a consequence, an automatic cutoff was sent. Uh, there are several possible workarounds to this. They're being looked into at this time, and we plan to resume our countdown at the T-minus 22 minute mark at 11 p.m. Now holding at T-minus 22 minutes, this is Kennedy Launch Control. This is Apollo Saturn launch, con launch Control. We're at T-minus 21 minutes, 10 seconds, and counting. The countdown picked up. The uh, launch team here made a quick check of the various elements, all reporting into the test supervisor, uh, Bill Schick, indicating that they were ready to resume the count. 
Now counting at T-minus 20 minutes, 53 seconds, and we'll continue to count down here as we look at the problem which caused the hold at the T-minus 30 second mark. Now T-minus 20 minutes, 42 seconds and counting. This is Kennedy Launch Control.
This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control. We're at T-minus 14 minutes, 35 seconds, and counting in our countdown for Apollo 17. Back at the Mission Control Center, the men there are updating the launch azimuth. Launch azimuth standing now at 82.54 degrees. This will automatically be fed into the instrument unit. The swing arm, swing arm number nine, the access arm to the spacecraft remains at the 12 degree position. It will remain there until the T-minus five minute mark in the countdown. Going on at this time are the cycling of some of the vents for the liquid hydrogen and the liquid oxygen. These are the uh, vents which allow the venting of these gases as there is some boil off occurring. It's necessary to continue venting these to ensure that they do not freeze in either an open or a closed position. The countdown proceeding smoothly now, T minus 13 minutes, 43 seconds and counting. This is Kennedy Launch Control.
This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control. We're at T-minus 9 minutes 36 seconds, and we are counting. However, we do plan to continue the hold at the T-minus 8-minute mark. We can hold at that point for 20 minutes and plan a 20-minute hold while the launch crew here satisfies themselves that they have worked out a, a good solution and a workaround to the problem. The crew has been alerted aboard the spacecraft. Cernan indicated that uh, perhaps they could start a nice conversation about a good book, Thomas Hardy or something like that. Countdown continuing now, aiming toward the uh, eight-minute mark, at which time we'll hold T-minus nine minutes now, T-minus nine minutes and counting. This is Kennedy Launch Control. This Apollo Saturn launch control we're now holding at the eight minute mark as planned. The hold at this time is planned for approximately 20 minutes. The crew feels that they have a, that they have a workaround to the problem, working around the indication going to the terminal sequencer that the tank has not been pressurized when actually it had been done manually. Uh, they are checking all of their data, however, to ensure that this is the proper method to work around the problem and that this will result in a smooth countdown from here on. Now T-minus eight minutes and holding. This is Kennedy Launch Control. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control. We're continuing our hold at the eight minute mark. The launch operations manager has gone over with the launch team their proposed solution and workaround. The team appears to be satisfied that it is the proper one. They are now briefing management personnel on the problem and the workaround. Out at the pad, the liquid oxygen continues to vent from the vehicle and is replenished. Liquid hydrogen is also vented from the vehicle as there is some boil off. However, because it is quite a volatile fuel, it's vented to a burn pond at the side of the pad. That burn pond is at the north side of the pad and there it can be seen burning in a controlled condition at this time. This is a normal condition. Uh, actually, during the day, this burns in such a pure manner that it cannot be seen. However, at night, it is clearly visible. Our countdown continuing to hold at the T-minus eight minute mark at this time. T-minus eight minutes and holding. This is Kennedy Launch Control. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control. We're continuing to hold at the T-minus eight-minute mark. Meantime, the crew is getting a variety of updates in the uh, spacecraft, updating them on various aspects and the changes to their mission due to this hold period. Also at the Manned Spacecraft Center, they're continuing uh, to update the flight azimuth as uh, they get new times for the launch. Launch Operations Manager Paul Donnelly uh, just went through quite an extensive briefing with the spacecraft test conductor to pass on to the crew uh, what they feel the problems were and how they plan to work around it. The crew uh, aboard the spacecraft indicated that if the launch team was satisfied with these solutions, they certainly were confident themselves. Now, continuing our hold at the T-minus eight-minute mark, this is Kennedy Test Control. Apollo Saturn launch control. We're continuing in our hold at the T minus eight minute mark. At this time, it's been determined to take an additional 20 minutes, add an additional 20 minutes to that plan hold period. The reason for this is the crews would like to take the workaround that they have devised and at Marshall Space Flight Center, where the Saturn V launch vehicle was developed, they have what is called a breadboard or a system which is similar to this one. And run through the sequence and ensure that it does operate properly. 
The crew aboard the spacecraft was informed of this additional 20-minute hold. They indicated that they expected to use all three stages of this Saturn V, and they were happy to have the 20-minute hold if that was going to assure that all three were going to work properly. Now continuing our hold at the T-minus 8-minute mark, this is Kennedy Launch Control. This is Apollo Saturn Test Control. We're continuing our hold at the T-minus 8-minute mark. The reason the T-minus 8-minute mark is chosen for this hold, as mentioned earlier, has to do with the chill-down of the thrust chambers in the S2, or second stage, and the third stage. Both of these stage stages use liquid hydrogen, an extremely cold or cryogenic fuel, and the thrust chamber must be conditioned prior to flight so that it's ready at the time of ignition in flight to receive these fuels coming in. To achieve the proper temperature, the <clears throat> the thrust chamber chill down should not exceed 20 minutes, but it must be on for at least 7 minutes and 40 seconds. So rounding that off, the, the hold was called at the 8 minute mark. We can continuously hold it at this point, whereas if we continued on down, uh, we would have to watch these parameters very closely so that we did not exceed that 20 minute accumulated cooling time. At this point, we can continue our hold uh, and that continuation can be determined by the problem and we can pick up then at any time or continue as long as necessary. We're continuing that hold now, T minus eight minutes and holding. This is Kennedy Launch Control. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control. We're continuing in our hold at the T minus eight minute mark. Back at the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama, crews there are at work on a breadboard or a mock-up of the system in question where they're putting it through its paces, checking out the workaround solution that is jumping around this erroneous signal and uh, ensuring that everything works properly. The crew is still uh, standing by in the spacecraft, updating uh, various systems there, updating their flight plan, uh, all continuing to go well. Uh, there. The crew at the Manned Spacecraft Center also doing considerable amount of updating. They'll be continuing to update the uh, azimuth and the Launch Control Center here at Kennedy Space Center. The uh, launch team manning their consoles standing by to pick up the count when we're given the word to go. However, we're standing by still at this time. We have no word <coughs> from the Marshall Space Flight Center. We're expecting that uh, to come within 10 to 15 minutes from this time. Now T-minus 8 minutes and holding. This is Kennedy Launch Control. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control. We're continuing in our hold period at this time. Test Supervisor Bill Schick just announced here in the firing room that the hold is expected to last approximately 20 more minutes. Liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen com continue to be replenished aboard the three stages of the launch vehicle at this time. That replenishing will continue during the hold period and during the final minutes of the countdown. Countdown continuing in the hold, T-minus eight minutes in holding. This is Kennedy Launch Control. Apollo Saturn launch control at one minute to midnight. One minute to midnight, we're continuing to hold at the T-minus eight minute mark. Work still going on at uh, the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. Updating of the uh, tracking, continuing at the Manned Spacecraft Center in uh, Houston, and the launch team here at Kennedy Space Center preparing to pick up the count. Hopefully we'll be given a go ahead to pick up the count in uh, approximately 10 to 12 minutes from this time. We are continuing to stand by, waiting to uh, hear from the testing going on at the uh, Marshall Space Flight Center in uh, Huntsville. To recap the activities earlier today, the countdown uh, picked up at 11.53 a.m. after a planned hold period, picked up at the T-minus nine hour mark. Shortly after that time, the pad was cleared and we began loading the cryogenic fuels, that's the liquid hydrogen and the liquid oxygen, aboard the space vehicle. Those operations actually went a little bit ahead of schedule. 
The astronaut crew went out to the pad, entered their spacecraft, began checking it out, and those operations also running a little bit ahead of schedule. We went on to our terminal countdown sequencer at the three minute, six second mark as scheduled. Everything seemed to be proceeding fine. At the T-minus 30 second mark, we got an automatic cutoff. It was determined that this cutoff came because pressurization of the uh, liquid oxygen tank aboard the third stage was not initiated automatically as it should have been. When it was done manually, the terminal sequencer did not sense that this had been done and therefore gave the automatic cutoff. We're uh, working the problem right now, continuing to hold at the T-minus eight minute mark. T-minus eight minutes and holding. This is Kennedy Launch Control. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control, continuing to hold at the T-minus eight minute mark. The hold continues to be planned for approximately uh, five to seven more minutes. However, the uh, launch window should be pointed out tonight uh, extends to 1.31 a.m. Now, if for any reason we could not make it in that launch window, we could recycle uh, under our present configuration and resume our count aiming for a 9.53 p.m. Eastern Standard Time launch tonight. The window for tonight is the same as it was for last night and this morning, 9.53 p.m. to 1.31 a.m. However, the launch team uh, appears to be optimistic with the solution they've found to the problem. They're just waiting for a verification and confirmation from the testing going on at the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. The time now is seven minutes after midnight. We're continuing to hold at T minus eight minutes. T minus eight minutes in holding. This is Kennedy Launch Control. Apollo Saturn launch control continuing to hold at the eight minute mark in the countdown. Still awaiting word from the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama, and the result of the test being run at this time up there. Meanwhile, here in the firing room, all elements of the launch team are assessing their position. They are assessing the effect of the hold and this uh, amount of hold time on uh, each of their systems. Everyone. Uh, at this time, busily at work here in the firing room, also at the Mission Control Center in Houston, uh, busy there with their flight updates. Now, continuing to hold at the T-minus eight-minute mark, this is Kennedy Launch Control. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control. We're at uh, 15 minutes past the hour, continuing to hold at the T-minus eight-minute mark. The supervisor just indicated that we plan to pick up the clock at the T-minus eight minute mark in 10 minutes, planning to pick up the clock at 25 minutes past the hour. The tests uh, being run at, or have been run now at the Marshall Space Flight Center and indicate that uh, our system is good the way it has been reconfigured. All elements now during this 10 minutes uh, will be preparing their various systems to pick up the clock at the T-minus eight minute mark. Meanwhile, out at the manned spacecraft center, the uh, flight controllers there are also planning to pick up the clock. We just received a go from the superintendent of range operations indicating that uh, the range has been cleared around the new flight azimuth. Manned spacecraft center, uh, Houston flight, indicates that they are go to pick up the clock at 25 minutes past the hour. Now T-minus eight minutes and holding. This is Kennedy Launch Control. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control. We're continuing our hold at the T-minus eight minute mark. We have approximately five more minutes remaining in that hold. It's been determined that the workaround uh, is a correct and satisfactory one, a breadboard or a sample system uh, at the Marshall Space Flight Center was used to run through the entire sequence as it's now configured and that operated satisfactorily. What happened was the, uh, during the terminal sequencer, the liquid oxygen tank was not pressurized automatically when this was done manually. The indication did not get to the sensors in time so that we had an automatic cutoff. The, <coughs> the liquid oxygen tanks aboard the third stage, it's been determined, 
will be pressurized manually early in the terminal sequence and jumpers have been installed so that we can then feed the information uh, to the sequencer so that it will not have an indication that the LOX tanks have not been pressurized. Uh, this, a breadboard situation of this has been constructed at the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville and this has operated satisfactorily. So it's been determined to go ahead with our countdown on this basis. We'll be planning to pick up the count at the T-minus eight minute mark some four minutes from now. Now T-minus eight minutes and holding, this is Kennedy Launch Control. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control. We're now resuming the count. T-minus seven minutes, 54 seconds and counting. At this time in the spacecraft, updates being given to the spacecraft commander, Eugene Cernan. The swing arm still at the 12 degree position, that's the park position, standing by at the spacecraft. That will be brought back to the full retract position at uh, approximately T minus five minutes in the countdown. The flight director just ran through the, uh, his team, a, a status report from his team at the Mission Control Center. Uh, that team all reported they are in a go condition. Now T minus seven minutes, 20 seconds and counting. This is Kennedy Launch Control. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control, T-minus five minutes, 40 seconds, and counting. At this time, the various elements of the launch team have been reporting into Bill Schick, the test supervisor, indicating that we are go to continue. Mission Director Chet Lee just verifies that we are go for launch. Safety indicates that we have a go. First stage test conductor, this is the man who has charge of those five first stage engines, which will give us the lift off, has indicated a go for launch. Launch operations manager, Paul Donnelly, also giving us a go for launch. And finally, the launch director, Walter Capri, and says we are go for launch. We've passed the five minute mark now and swing arm number nine. This is the access arm to the spacecraft, is coming back to the full retract position. It moves back alongside the mobile launch tower and it will remain there now through the final portion of the countdown and the launch. At the T-minus 60 second mark, 20 nozzles will start flame deflector deluge of 13,000 gallons per minute of water pouring down on that flame deflector. So a great deal of what is seen at launch time, which looks like smoke is actually steam as this water is burned off, this water to cool the pad area and to cool the equipment uh, alongside of the uh, launch tower as the water also pours across the swing arms in the launch tower. We're approaching the four minute mark in the countdown now. T minus four minutes, five seconds and continuing to count. At the four minute mark, we'll stand by for a final go from Norm Carlson, the launch vehicle test conductor. He's given a go. 
with the uh, launch operations manager now switching over to the uh, Astrocom circuit. This is the circuit that the astronauts, the launch operations manager, and the uh, spacecraft communicator will remain on. They uh, have this private circuit to keep extraneous talk off of their circuit. Uh, they, are, they are checking in. They are checking in now on the Astrocom circuit, uh, indicating that they are go. Spacecraft has indicated they are ready. Instrument unit uh, ready light has come on. S1C, that's the first stage. Preparations are now complete as we approach the three-minute mark. There is quiet in the firing room now as the engineers and technicians are monitoring their consoles. They're monitoring the various rates, pressures, temperatures. They can override the terminal sequencer if they uh, cite a problem that it has not picked up. We are on that terminal sequencer now. We've passed the three-minute mark, T-minus two minutes, 47 seconds, and counting as we are on the terminal sequencer. At the T-minus 50-second mark, we'll be looking for that critical power transfer. This is where we transfer from the external power source, which has been feeding the three stages of the launch vehicle, to internal power. That's to the flight batteries uh, aboard the space vehicle. It's expected that uh, given proper weather conditions, people will be observing this flight from as much as 500 miles away. This includes a large portion of the southeastern United States, the northern tip of Cuba, and the Bahama Islands. Now approaching the two minutes, two minute mark. Mark, T minus two minutes and counting, and the countdown continues to move along smoothly. Now in the uh, terminal countdown portion. The automatic sequencer has stopped the replenishing of the liquid oxygen and the liquid hydrogen. We're standing by uh, now to begin pressurization of the fuel tanks, the second stage fuel tank pressurized, third stage fuel tank pressurized. The countdown continuing to move along smoothly, T minus 90 seconds, T minus 90 seconds. Countdown continuing smoothly. S4B propellants uh, pressurized. The indication now using the workaround showing the S4B propellants have been pressurized. Now looking at the liquid hydrogen tanks as uh, they become pressurized. LH2 aboard the second stage pressurized. All propellants now aboard the second stage pressurized as we approach the one minute mark in the countdown. Mark T minus one minute and counting. Now in the final minute of the countdown. At T minus 45 seconds, Gene Cernan will make the final guidance alignment. This is the uh, mark T minus 45, and Gene Cernan made that final guidance alignment. That's the last action taken by the crew aboard the space vehicle. Now approaching the half minute mark. T minus 33, T minus 30 seconds, and continuing on now, continuing on at the T minus 26 second mark, T minus 25. We'll get a final guidance uh, release at the T minus 17 second mark. T minus 17, final guidance release. We'll expect engine ignition at 8.9 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, ignition sequence started. All engines are started. We have ignition, two, one, zero, we have a liftoff. We have a liftoff and it's lighting up the area. It's just like daylight here at Kennedy Space Center as the Saturn V is moving off the pad. It has now cleared the tower. Tower, you are complete. We're in the roll, Bob. Roger, Gino, looking great. Thrust good on all five engines. Okay, babe, it's looking good here. Roll is complete. We are pitching. Mission Control, Gene Cernan reporting uh, the launch vehicle, maneuvering to the proper attitude, everything looking good at this point. 17 is go. Roger, 17, you're go. First stage looks good, altitude 1.1 miles. Okay, one minute, 68 degrees, okay? Everything looks great over here, okay? Okay, stand by for Max, coming through Max here. We'll be at 68 degrees. The booster says we look good. We're now at 2.5 miles. Mark, mode 1, Bravo. Roger, 1, Bravo. We're going one minute. Roger, Gene, you're looking great. Right on the line. 
Everybody says looking great, right on the line. We're now one mile downrange. Launch vehicle 4.2 miles high. Yeah, this thing shakes like the sun. Yeah, that's max Q. Wait till we get our max Q. Stay down there, Q meter. Coming up on maximum dynamic pressure at this point. Four miles downrange, eight miles high, and the velocity approaching 3,000 feet per second. Two Gs. Two and a half Gs. See it quiets out after Max Q. Yep, quiets out. Pushing three Gs. Okay. Can't hold my hand up anymore. Yep. <laughs> okay, we're out of Max Q. Okay. Cabin's still looking good. Alpha's PC. Okay, stand by for... Uh, stand by for mode 1, Charlie 17. 1, Charlie. Mark, mode 1, Charlie. Atmos Flight Dynamics Charlie. Officer says we look good on all sources, uh, right on the trajectory. Roger 17, you're go. Flight Director Gene Kranz taking a status for staging. We say we look good for staging. Roger, we're going here. It's for 82. Stand by for board. Okay, that's for 82. Inboard cut off. Roger, inboard. Okay, now hold on. engine shutting down on time as planned. Okay, it's 19. Now at 41. 41, okay. Three and a half Gs. Crew will experience maximum G forces of about four Gs uh, at shutdown. Which Gs? Four Gs. Coming up on first stage shutdown. Look at that son of a bitch. Man. And we've had shut down off time on the first stage. We got all five. Roger, they're looking here, looking good. Okay, stand by, sir. Sure felt like it. Stand by, hold it. I think we saw them all from here. Roger, Jack, and the thrust is going, all five of them, they're running good. Okay, three minutes in, we're go. Yes, Roger, Roger. Hey, this is smooth. Okay, I got the tower switches on my baby. Go. Okay, 13. There's okay, go. we got it. Go. Nineteen. Roger, we confirm skirt depth. Watch it, Jack. Nineteen, there goes the tower. Ah, there she goes. Roger, the tower, you're mode two. Roger, mode two. Okay, manager, that's your command. The steering has converged and CMC is go. You're going right down the pike, 17. Okay, Bob, I do confirm guidance. And ELS set circuit breakers, you get chance, sir, Jim. That's the automatic guidance system, the inertial okay, guidance Bob, system performing properly. Circuit breakers and uh, we've seen it all, ignition, uh, staging, and tower. Roger, okay. By the way, the cabin sealed. Apollo <laughs> <laughs> okay, 17, now 65 miles okay. high. Well, I where we're going here. Okay, four minutes and we're go here, Bob. Roger, Gene, we're going around the room, look, go here. 21 degrees, remote two. You're looking real good, Gene. Right down the line. Okay, it's, it's uh, looking pretty good. Let me uh, get a uh, freeze here on the 430. I can't see that. Let's see. Okay, 430, and we're still going on board. Roger, 17, you're go. Let me tell you, this night launch is something to behold. Okay, each and each that are good. Okay, I don't know if you'll be able Coming to up on five rising. minutes, uh, everything still looks very good in the launch yeah, of Apollo 17. Yeah. The launch vehicle, spacecraft now 80 miles high, 230 okay, miles downrange. One G. Yeah. I got some stars out the right, but I don't see. Five minutes, Gino, and you're go down here. You're looking great. What's that? Okay. Okay, Robert, we're go here at five. Coming up on this will be to see you guys believe me about that S1 stage in there? <laughs> I, I, I can't believe how smooth I this can't, is. I can't believe how smooth this is. Okay, let's keep this mother burning. We got a long way to go. We're only 17 Houston, your times are nominal. Level sense arm at 8 plus 36. S2 shut down at 9 plus 20. Nominal times. 8 plus 36 and 9 plus 20. Roger. Coming up on gimbal motors, you know. Okay. Capcom Robert Overmeyer uh, advising Gene Cernan and the crew aboard Apollo 17. The second stage shut down uh, at about 9 minutes, 20 seconds elapsed time. Uh, that shut down about 3 and a half uh, minutes we're from now. Wrong. Nope. Okay, we're still mode 2. Coming Stand up. by for S4B to COI capability. Mark, S4B to COI capability. Roger, S4B to COI. We're going 6. Good. 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 Go ahead. Roger, Dino. Pitch 1. Got it. And you all won. Got it. 
Go ahead. Okay, why not? I'm joking. Pitch two. Got it. And y'all two. Apollo 17 okay. still right on the nominal trajectory. Uh, at an altitude now of about 92 nautical okay, miles. Uh, we, we got, got four good motors, motors and we're going 620. Roger, uh, yeah, I think we yeah, copy yeah, the gimbals and we watch them. They look good. Wouldn't <laughs> Just like sitting on the bed. And... The silver star. <laughs> okay, our calibration on that tank changed a little bit again, apparently. Okay. Down at 90%. Right. Stand by for S4B to orbit capability. Mark S4B to orbit capability. And we'd like Omni Delta Jack. Roger. Uh, seven minutes. Got it. Yep. Uh, Roger. Seven on six degrees. How's that? Sound? Now seven okay, minutes good. in, and we uh, have sufficient velocity to make yeah, orbit with the Saturn right third stage. Should we have an unexpected early shutdown of the second five, stage? Roger. Uh, right I'm glad I took my hand off that abort hand. Oh, man. So am I. <laughs> I'll tell you. <laughs> okay, we got to get through this one and then through stage. Stand now, less than board. two minutes from second stage shutdown and ignition of the Saturn yeah. third stage. And the center engine stage. will be shutting down as okay, scheduled uh, in about uh, 10 seconds. Yeah, we have inboard cut off. Roger, Jane, inboard on time. And that inboard shutdown looked to be on time. Okay, and she pitches up just like the simulator. Yeah, sure does, pitches. Apollo 17 now, 625 miles downrange, 93 miles in altitude. Eight minutes, and we are go. Roger, 17, you're looking great. God, this is really good. Yeah, let's stand by for a PU shift. Is that what that was? Yeah, I think it was. Yeah, I think it was it. Okay, the spacecraft down. guidance system is agreeing very okay. closely with the Saturn guidance. It looks good. Go for staging. Thank you, Bob. Uh, we are go for staging up here. A little over G. There's a little chuck. Staging now less than one minute. Okay, we got to get through this one. Coming in, we're in level sense arm now. You have level sense arm this time, Gene. Roger, Bob. Level sense arm. Okay, Ryan, our next thing will be standby for mode four, and we'll have Apollo 17 on traveling at 21,000 feet per second. It's achieved about 83% of the velocity required for a minimum orbit. All right, Miss Bob, and Miss 17 is go. Roger, 17, you're go here. And about 10 seconds to staging. Stand by for mode 4 capability. Let's do cut off. Mark, mode 4 capability and we copy cut off. Roger, mode 4. And we do have S4B ignition. Roger, we see it and the thrust is looking good on it. You see that glow go We saw that, that one, one too, Bob. Bob. Roger. Yeah, we're right in the flame. Yeah, that's what the uh, Titan used to do. Used to fly through the flame of that thing. Let's, uh, let's press on here. We got okay, a lot okay. to do. Remote we're up to 23,000 feet per second. Okay, we'll be shooting at, for something uh, uh, over 25,000. Okay, 10 minutes run. I'll be at about uh, 40. 17, the steering has converged, and the CMC is go. You're looking great. Roger, the CMC is go. 10 minutes, and 17 is go on board. Okay, so that's a little bit low, but not bad. 17, Houston, you are go for orbit. Go for orbit. Those are kind words, Robert. We're go for orbit here. Good show, Gene. Okay, coming up on 3-0, Ron. Okay. Uh, double check everything. Coming three up zero, on 10 minutes, 30 degrees. seconds after uh, uh, a liftoff. Okay, and the uh, spacecraft launch vehicle now 11,000, uh, 1,100 miles rather downrange. Okay, altitude 93.4 miles. Roger, Roger. Roger. Okay, the cutoff is VI plus 100. VI plus 100. Okay, I'll catch you I just want to hit the camera. And we're about one minute from shutdown, about one minute from orbit insertion. Eleven minutes and we are go. Roger, Gene, and cutoff will be at one one plus four seven. One one plus four seven. 
One one plus four seven, Raj. Okay, eleven thirty, and we'll go here and uh, stand by. Roger, Dean. Cutoff time is still holding good. Eleven plus four seven. Okay, cut off at four two. Understand. Cut off at four two. Ready, we copy. And that looked like a near nominal shutdown. At shutdown, we show twenty five thousand six hundred feet per second. That also looks very close. Eighty nine point five. Roger, Gene, we're copying the disk key. Okay, Jack. Gene Cernan reporting the onboard indication of an orbit of 93.5 by 89.5. Uh, we'll be getting tracking and confirming that here on the ground. Range safety is safe, and we you are in a go orbit nominal. Roger, go orbit nominal. Thank you. And 17, I'll be unable to update that uh, AOS time, but 5220 is looking good. This is Apollo Control coming up on 14 minutes after liftoff. That liftoff coming about uh, two hours, 40 minutes late. And we'll be assessing the effects uh, of that late liftoff on subsequent events in the mission timeline, passing those along. Uh, one of the effects will be a change in the uh, acquisition of signal, loss of signal time uh, as we move, uh, move along on the uh, ground track. See you off. Stand by on that, Jack. I've been carrying very low amps on uh, the bat bus, and I did not see a drop. I'm carrying about two amps now. Volts are three, uh, three zero point five. Jack, go ahead and take the BC motor switch off. It's off, and I confirm that one. And we think it's the EDS power switch and the fuel cell last switch that are uh, drawing the current that you're seeing there. Okay, that could well be. Okay, Jack, we're going to lose you in about one minute off of Vanguard here and see you at 5220. Roger, we're pressing. Thanks, Bob. Okay, Bob, everything is looking to go on board. Uh, everything's stable. Uh, we can see the apps firing, uh, and our attitudes look good. Jano, everything's in good shape down here. The booster's in good shape. You're looking good, and our AOS time is uh, 5220, as I gave you. We got that, babe. We'll see you coming around. Good show, babe. A little late, but a good show. That's standing right.
17 Houston, we're hanging with you here. It looks like you're hanging in Vanguard a little longer than we expected. This is Apollo Control at uh, 16 minutes, 45 seconds after liftoff. Uh, we've confirmed Apollo 17 is in a near nominal orbit. The crew reported uh, an orbit of about 93.5 by 89.5 based on their onboard calculations. And uh, computations on the ground uh, show that we're very close to the uh, nominal 90 mile uh, nautical mile orbit. As a result of the late liftoff, the uh, translunar injection uh, will be a little bit earlier than the uh, flight plan ground elapsed time. Uh, we don't have a, an update on this time yet. Uh, we expect that it will be on the order of 8 to 10 minutes early. Uh, we will update that time as we get uh, a later update. Uh, we would expect, uh, expect that uh, the time of arrival at the moon uh, will be approximately the same as the flight plan time uh, in terms of Greenwich Mean Time. Uh, the ground elapsed time uh, will be uh, somewhat earlier, and we expect that there will be a uh, clock update, a so-called clock update, at some point where we uh, make the clocks in mission control and aboard the spacecraft uh, agree with the ground elapsed time uh, that they would be showing in the flight plan. Uh, the net effect will be that we'll arrive uh, at the moon in a, uh, a shorter ground elapsed time, in effect uh, about two hours, 40 minutes uh, earlier than the flight plan would show, but at the same Greenwich Mean Time or local time here on Earth uh, that uh, we would have had had we left it off on time. Uh, we're in effect making up the time by speeding up the arrival at the moon. Uh, the spacecraft at uh, translunar injection uh, will be going somewhat uh, faster than uh, a nominal liftoff translunar injection. Uh, consequently, uh, it will arrive at the moon going slightly faster and also somewhat earlier, about two hours, 40 minutes earlier in terms of ground elapsed time. Uh, this will also mean that the lunar orbit insertion uh, will require a bit more energy to uh, slow the spacecraft down and get it into lunar orbit. Uh, these details, of course, will all be worked out uh, in the time that we have before uh, lunar orbit insertion. And when we get an updated uh, translunar injection time, we'll pass that along. This is Apollo Control at uh, 24 minutes. Apollo 17 uh, now in an orbit uh, about 90 miles by 93 miles. And everything appears to be nominal aboard the spacecraft and aboard the uh, uh, launch vehicle, Saturn third stage. Uh, one additional impact of our late liftoff will be the loss of television coverage uh, for the transposition and docking maneuver. Uh, the Television coverage will not be possible because the ground track has shifted. Uh, we don't have the site coverage that uh, had been expected for uh, television. The translunar injection uh, burn, uh, reigniting the Saturn third stage to put the spacecraft on, a on its trajectory to the moon, is now scheduled to occur at a ground elapsed time of 3 hours, 12 minutes, 35 seconds, or roughly 9 minutes earlier uh, than the flight plan time. Uh, this, again, the effect of the late liftoff. And we'll be reacquiring Apollo 17 uh, through the Carnarvon tracking station at a ground elapsed time of about 52 minutes, 20 seconds, uh, roughly 27 minutes from now. This is Apollo Control, now 32 minutes after the uh, liftoff of Apollo 17. Uh, we have loss of signal uh, with the spacecraft. We'll be reacquiring through the Carnarvon uh, tracking station uh, in about 20 minutes. And from the President of the United States, we have the following message to the crew of Apollo 17. The message reads, as you set forth on the final Apollo expedition to the moon, I want to have my personal 
Best wishes for a successful mission and safe return. I'm sure your voyage of scientific exploration will be the crowning achievement in a program which has expanded man's horizons, brought great credit to your country, and lifted the spirits of people all over the world. Godspeed to you all. Signed, Richard Nixon. The flight dynamics officer, uh, continuing to uh, process tracking data uh, following orbital insertion, uh, reports that there is a small amount of out-of-plane error uh, showing up in the orbit. Uh, this, uh, it is believed, is uh, uh, due to a small uh, error in the instrument unit of the Saturn third stage. Uh, however, the uh, orbit is very close uh, to nominal, uh, about 90 nautical miles by 93 nautical miles. And we look very good, both with respect to the uh, spacecraft and with respect to the Saturn third stage, which must perform that uh, burn, uh, putting Apollo 17 on its trajectory toward the moon. At 34 minutes, this is Apollo Control, Houston. This is Apollo Control. The uh, post-launch press conference at uh, Cape Kennedy is scheduled to begin at uh, 12.33 Central Standard Time, uh, 1.33 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Again, that time, 12.33 Central Standard Time, 1.33 uh, Eastern Standard uh, for the post-launch press conference at Cape Kennedy. Control at uh, 51 minutes uh, into the flight of Apollo 17, and we're standing by to reacquire the spacecraft through the Carnarvon Australian Tracking Station. Uh, one of the things that the booster engineer will be looking for uh, when we reacquire and get good uh, uh, lock on the data will be the Saturn third stage instrument unit. Uh, looking at uh, one brief bit of data. Uh, before we lost signal, it appeared that one of the four batteries in the instrument unit uh, had a very high current drain on it. Uh, we will be looking closely uh, at that uh, to see if it was simply a, uh, a telemetry uh, problem or if, in fact, that battery uh, does have uh, 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 some problem. And we should be about 15 seconds now from reacquiring. I'm here. Uh, you might want to know this, Jack. Uh, your sunset and sunrise times in the launch checklist are all off by eight, approximately eight minutes and 30 seconds. That every sunset and sunrise will occur about eight minutes and 30 seconds sooner than in the in the launch checklist. That's an approximate number. Okay, we got you. Okay, and on page uh, 2-17 of the launch checklist, you're going to want to delete all reference to honeysuckle, AOS, and LOS and delete all reference to Canaries, AOS, and LOS. Okay. And we want to add an ascension, pass AOS, an ascension, one plus five four plus zero zero, and ascension LOS will be zero two zero zero one six. Okay, Bob, you're going to have to uh, repeat that. Okay, uh, stand by. Let me give you a page. On 2-17, let's go a Hawaii AOS, first of all. On a Hawaii AOS on page 2-17, AOS is 0-1 plus 1-7 plus 2-4. Hawaii LOS, 0-1 plus 2-2 plus 4-niner. Gotcha. Now, what about the ascension? Okay, here, give you the ascension again now. The AOS, one plus five, four, plus zero, zero. Ascension LOS will be zero, two, zero, zero, one, six.
Over. Okay, I got those. Uh, Hawaii is 1 plus 17 plus 24. And LOS is 1 plus 22 plus 49. And Ascension is ALS 1 plus 5400. And LOS 2 plus 0016. Roger, Jack. Good copy. And uh, booster's looking good down here and looking good. Okay, and uh, I'll do a better job of uh, itemizing those switches. Uh, we were pressing pretty hard, and I'll, uh, I'll be able to go back and get most of them, I think, and uh, we'll keep an eye on it, on the master alarms. Roger, Jack. We understand, and I think we copied most of what you said there, and we're working on it. Okay, Bob, other than, uh, than that master alarm, all is well in America. I understand the booster is looking good to you. That's affirmative. And Bob, let me uh, add that not, we did get spurious master alarms without switch movement, but many came with switch movements. We've had about seven. Okay, I understand. That was only after insertion. Seven times that your heart doesn't need, huh? Oh, uh, we were paying attention to a sunset that was the biggest sunrise. Or sunrise or something that we saw. It was the biggest rainbow I'd ever seen. Beautiful. We can't wait to hear what you had to say about that uh, the ignition on the S2. It sounded pretty spectacular. Well, I'll just let it be said that that was uh, quite a booster ride. We got a chance a little later. Uh, Roger. We're about ready to lose calm here. You're looking great, uh, guys, and uh, we'll pick you up in Hawaii here shortly. Okay, we're looking at the deserts of Australia right now, and uh, again, everything's good on board. Roger. Pick you up at 117.24. Gotcha. This is Apollo Control. We're coming up now on one hour uh, after liftoff for Apollo 17. And as you heard, uh, Capcom Robert Overmeyer reporting to the crew that uh, everything looks good, including the Saturn third stage. Uh, apparently the uh, indication we had of a possible battery problem in the instrument unit, uh, nothing more than uh, a bad bit of telemetry there. Uh, when the booster engineer got a good hard look at the telemetry on this pass, uh, reported everything looked good. Uh, we're ready at this point to, to begin the post-launch press conference at Cape Kennedy. Uh, we'll switch to Cape Kennedy now and stand by for that press conference. This is Apollo Control, one hour, 25 minutes after liftoff. Uh, during the post-launch press conference at uh, Cape Kennedy, uh, we had uh, a short uh, acquisition with the crew through the Hawaiian tracking station. Uh, during that uh, period of conversation and uh, during that period of monitoring the systems on the spacecraft and the launch vehicle, uh, we found that uh, the situation was essentially unchanged. That is, both vehicles uh, looking good, the spacecraft and the launch vehicle. And we're progressing towards a normal translunar injection, uh, one hour, 46 minutes, 50 seconds from now. The crew has discussed one uh, uh, unexplained series of events. It appears that uh, when certain switches are uh, cycled or moved on panel two, which is the uh, main panel in front of them, the center panel of the spacecraft, uh, they're getting a, a master caution and warning signal. A light comes on, a tone comes on. This is to attract the uh, crew's attention that uh, something may be wrong in the normal procedure is then to look at another matrix of lights, which uh, would zero them in on the problem. Uh, the light, or the, the system or subsystem, or a particular area uh, being monitored, uh, which had the problem, uh, would light an individual light. Uh, however, when they go to this other uh, matrix of lights, uh, they find that none of them are lighted. Uh, this is leading the crew and uh, flight controllers here in Mission Control to believe that they're getting a spurious signal to the master caution and warning uh, when, in fact, uh, nothing is wrong. We don't have any further explanation for the problem at this point. Uh, we will continue to look at the data uh, 
and uh, particularly during the translunar coast, uh, we think we'll get uh, uh, a good long time to uh, look at things in detail and try to find out precisely what is happening. At this point, however, the problem uh, presents no concern, and one of the more likely explanations or possible explanations that's been advanced is uh, perhaps some contamination uh, in, in some switches. Uh, we did accumulate some uh, taped conversation during the press conference with the crew. We'll replay that for you now and then stand by for uh, acquisition of signal uh, over the United States. Hello, Earthlings. We're back with you. Roger, Jack. Lead you loud and clear. How is it? loud and clear, and uh, no change systems-wise that I've seen. Roger, Jack. Any more master alarms? We had one when Ron's, uh, looks like his neck ring hit panel two. Okay, sounds like we had some loose in panel two, huh? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, it may be annoying, but so far it doesn't seem to be a problem. Roger. Just uh, for your information, everything is looking outstanding and no problems. We're taking a good look at the data here at Hawaii, and we'll make a go-no-go -no -go decision about 60 seconds after acquisition at Goldstone, but there's nothing right now to lead us to believe a zero opportunity will be required. Okay, Bob, understand that. Uh, we are prepared, however. Uh, spacecraft, other than those master alarms, is, uh, is looking very good. We uh, got the docking probe extended. The SCS uh, reference attitude check is complete. All right, sir. Okay, Bob, I just remembered another switch that I think gave us a master alarm uh, was H2O quantity indicator. Oh, Roger, copy that, Jack. H2O quantity indicator. Roger, we're, uh, 17, we're going to lose you in about 30 seconds, but when you get over the state side here, we're going to take a take the dump on the data and we'll read it out real carefully, so when you get in TLC, we ought to be able to see where that master alarm uh, glitch is coming into. Okay, Bob, and uh, uh, yell at me if you want anything done on the comm with this uh, change in AOS, LOS stuff. Uh, negative on that right now. We'll see you at 128.59 through Goldstone. Okay, 128.59, uh, Bob. We'll be there. Roger, Jay. 17 Houston, we're back with you. Okay, Roger. Bob. Uh, we're still the uh, same as before, and... Uh, Ready when you are for TLI. Roger. I can see the lights of Southern California, Bob. I detect. We're going to be going a little bit south of that area. Right, your ground shaft looks like it's picking you right up over the mid part of Baja, California. Yes, sir, I'll believe that. I'll bet you I can see Ensenada right now. Roger. Bob, I expect you'll probably be able to see the lights of Silver City, too. Well, I'm sure going to be looking for them, I'll tell you. Jack, just for your information, you'll probably, when you come up a little farther in this orbit here and get over Mexico, you should be able to see all that uh, bad weather that was like, giving us so much worry and had Kindle and, and New Orleans and everything all messed up this morning when I went through there. Uh, it was a pretty bad line of uh, weather along there. I was assuming it wasn't too bad. I think you made it, didn't you? Oh yeah, I made it, but I had to, uh, you know, I had to work at it. But it's, uh, we were, I was worried about it getting down to towards uh, Milo there after, you know, if we had to scrub and go tomorrow night. And boy, I'm sure glad we got you off tonight. Guess who else is? <laughs> no, I uh, wouldn't believe that. Parker can't make it back. He's got to uh, come back on the golf stream, so you might have to have Young on for a while uh, after we do a TLI. Hey, uh, you, you just wouldn't believe, Bob, the uh, light you can see in the west right now. It must be absolutely clear. Roger, Jack. Sounds spectacular. Jack, uh, people in the room here want to know if you've been down your checklist yet. Oh, we got that out of the way in about five minutes. Have we missed something? Oh, there's a different checklist here we were talking about. <laughs> uh, 
If you're talking about the uh, flight plan, uh, <laughs> yes. Roger. What a waste. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, we must be just south of Arizona now. Is that right? Right, Bob? That looks real good. Uh, yeah, you're over Mexico there. It looks like you're, oh, maybe 100 miles south of the border there. Okay, uh, I was pretty sure I was looking up in the Phoenix Tucson complex there. I do understand. Beautiful. Are you receiving Houston now? All right, Bob, you came up unreadable with the squeal that time. Uh, am I still squealing? Uh, is this Houston? That's the firm. You're very loud, almost unreadable with the squeal. Bob, why don't you give us a short count? Gino, don't change anything. We think it's a ground site uh, situation here, and just stand by. I believe it's in the VHF, uh, Bob. Bob, I'm not sure exactly where we are, but I'm looking out uh, uh, to an awful lot of uh, lights on the horizon out there at 12 o'clock and uh, an awful lot of lightning in the clouds out there. Roger, uh, we show you just about over the middle of the gulf. Uh, looking ahead, you're probably seeing the very southern tip of Florida there. It looks like the, almost the entire Florida peninsula has got lights uh, uh, outlining it somewhere. Roger. How's my comms on to you now, Gene? Okay, give us a quick short count. Roger, short count follows. Five, four, three, two, one. One, two, three, four, five. Short count out. Bob, you're all right now. Okay. And uh, can you 
give us a feel for uh, what the final weather was at the Cape at launch? Uh, uh, yeah, let, let me get that for you. The reason why we had that problem on the comm is we just handed over from Texas to Mila, and uh, we're, you're, we're going through Mila now, and it's great, so we had a little problem with our Texas site. Okay. The uh, television coverage had you all the way through staging uh, very well on S and the S2 ignition, and, and you went right behind a cloud uh, for a while, but they were uh, tracking you pretty well. Okay. They also uh, cut in for about a half a minute or so and showed a, uh, a view of the crowd in just the available light from the booster, and it stood out pretty well. Okay, Bob, we're going right over Florida now. Uh, looking down at Miami, a beautiful view of the Keys all lit up. And I just saw a shooting star right over Miami. Roger. That's a very, very fine view of Miami. Hard to believe. I'll bet they sat there and watched you go. Looks like we're right over the Bahamas now, Bob. Roger, I'll buy that. Well, I'm not easily impressed, Bob, but I'm certainly impressed by this one. Roger. What's the CMP doing? We haven't heard much from him. Is, it, is he at the other window? He's crawling around looking for things down in the LAV. <laughs> okay. They won't let you have a window tonight, huh, Ron? Uh, catch one here pretty quick. Just a reminder, if you haven't already done it, uh, there's no need to unstow the TV because due to this late launch, there's just no site available. Okay, Bob, uh, we're not going to unstow it. Bob, I don't, uh, I guess there's no site available uh, for some time, is that correct? That's affirmative, and if I can pull one of you guys away from a window, I've got a TLI plus 90 pad. Oh, I'd love to copy that. Just a minute. Go ahead. Okay, uh, lost you there for a minute. We had good signal strength all through that, so I figured it was your problem. Roger, uh, we were just waiting here for you. Are you ready well, for the pad? We were calling you and you missed us, so you might think about that. Ready for the pad. Okay, it's a TLI plus 90. SPS GNN. 66953 minus 059er. Plus one eight eight. Ignition time zero zero four four zero zero one four eight minus zero three five one eight minus zero 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 one plus three three seven eight two. Roll is one eight zero zero seven three zero zero three. Now ninety four is H A is not applicable. H P is plus zero zero two zero one three three nine or six four four five zero three three eight zero eight. Sexton star is number 11. That's 11-3424-3388. One, one, three, four, two, four, three, two, three. Stand by. 17 uh, Houston, are you still reading me? Uh, 
Captain, if you read, uh, we're reading you. I got you all the way through the trending on Sexton Star. Okay, we'll have to wait and pick you up at Ascension. We just had a keyhole pass at Bermuda and a little bit of pass at Vanguard. Okay, uh, I'll wait for you to finish that and on the read back, okay? That's affirmative. Stand by, we've got Vanguard. I can continue on with uh, after Trunion. The Boreside Star is not applicable, Jack. Now in 61, plus 1, 3, 2, Niner, minus 0, 3, 2, 0, 0, 1, 0, Niner, Niner, 2, 3, 4, Niner, 0, 4, GET of 0, 5G, 0, 2, 4, 3, 8, Zero Niner. Want to read back that much of the pad, Jack? Okay, Bob. Uh, it's a TLI plus ninety pad. SPS GNN six six nine five three minus zero five Niner plus one eight eight zero zero four four zero zero one four eight minus zero three five one eight minus four zeros one plus three three seven eight two one eight zero zero seven three zero zero three H A is N A plus zero zero two zero one three three nine six four four five four three three eight zero eight one one three four two four three two three foresight is N A Plus one three two niner minus zero three two zero zero one zero nine nine two three four nine zero four zero two four three eight zero niner over. Roger Jack, good read back except burn time is four five zero and not four five four. And we'll be losing here in about a minute, so I'll wait on the rest of that pad. Uh, just a reminder for Ron, we'll be standing by at Ascension for uh, the next gyro torquing, and uh, we might have a drift update on the uh, IMU there. Okay, he copied that, and we'll wait for the rest of the pass. Okay. Our time was 450, I think that's where we started to cut out. Roger. Seventeen. Uh, this is Houston through a How do you read over? Seventeen. Houston uh, through a How do you read over? Center, right? How do you read? Houston, how do you read through Orion?
is Apollo Control at uh, one hour, 51 minutes. Uh, we're getting good telemetry data uh, from Apollo 17 through one of the Apollo range instrumented aircraft uh, out over the Atlantic Ocean. Apollo 17 uh, moving across the Atlantic now towards uh, Africa. And on the next revolution, uh, at about this point, uh, the spacecraft will be uh, on its way to the moon doing the translunar injection maneuver. Ignition for that burn is scheduled to occur uh, one hour, 21 minutes from now. During launch, the uh, flight surgeon monitoring heart rates on the three crewmen uh, recorded peak heart rates uh, of 130 for the commander, Gene Cernan, uh, also 130 uh, for command module pilot, Ron Evans, and 115 for uh, lunar module pilot, Jack Schmidt. Uh, we should be reacquiring the uh, uh, command service modules and reestablishing voice communications with the astronauts uh, in about uh, two minutes from now uh, through Ascension. We should be uh, acquiring the spacecraft through ascension in about five seconds and uh, reestablishing voice communications with the crew. Seventeen, Houston. Go ahead. Hi, uh, Roger. You're back with us. I'll finish up that uh, TLI plus ninety pad so we can talk a little here if you want. Go ahead. Okay. Set stars are Sirius and Rigel. Our line is three one eight one four eight three five eight. There'll be no LH. Okay, down at the bottom of the pad, we got the P thirty seven for liftoff plus niner. GET is zero zero niner zero zero. Delta VT four eight niner seven. Longitude minus one seven five GET of four hundred K zero three three four nine or over. Okay, Bob, uh, zero uh, <coughs> Sirius and Rigel, three one eight one four eight three five eight. No LH zero zero nine zero zero four eight nine seven minus one seven five. Zero three three four niner. Over. Okay, Jack. Good rebate. Okay, Bob. Uh, we had, uh, as usual, uh, up here <laughs> a spectacular sunrise, and Gene wants to talk to you. I got some numbers on Ross B fifty two for you, Bob. Okay, standing by. The copy. Go ahead. Okay, now seventy one. We're stars twenty two and twenty four. Nine five are all balls. Now 93s are all minus. There is zero, zero, 
zero three seven zero 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 seven and zero 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 two one. That's minus thirty seven, minus zero seven, and minus twenty one, and they were torqued at one fifty one forty. Okay, we copy. Bob, we're over uh, what might be uh, intermediate to uh, low stratus that have a very strong crenulation pattern, uh, pulling out some geological terms here. I don't think I've ever seen anything like it uh, flying. Roger. Looks like about a north-south uh, lineation with a very strong crinkling uh, roughly east-west. Roger, copy that. It's interesting. You know, you're uh, just directly over that South Atlantic area. Your you, your path just kind of kept you going right between the uh, Africa and South America, right dead center all the way. And 17, just for your information, we've searched all the data we can, and we cannot find anything wrong with the spacecraft or the booster at all. Everything's looking real fine, and the only problem in the air is that uh, those master alarms which you have reported, we're not able to tie in anything common yet to any of those things either. Okay, Bob, we have not had any for uh, quite some time, I think, since the last time we talked to you about them. Roger, I understand. We'll probably get a good workout on that after TLI and try and track it down a little more. Okay, but also we have not really been doing much switching since the insertion checklist was complete either. Roger, I understand. Got you glued to the windows, I guess, huh? They are interesting, I'll say that. Well, I certainly am, uh, Bob, and uh, again, there's a big, a fairly continuous intermediate cloud deck, I think, and uh, it has patterns comparable to what I've seen on uh, pictures of ice flows. I don't see uh, Our pack ice, I should say, uh, pictures of pack ice from the Antarctic. Seventeen, Houston, we've got two questions concerning the master alarms. Uh, one, do you get the master alarm on the LEB also? And two, do you get the tone with the master alarm? Uh, we did get the tones. The master alarms were on both uh, uh, panel one and panel three. I uh, can't tell you about the LEB right now. Maybe Ron can. No, I didn't pay that much attention. Okay. Hey, Bob, there was something interesting, and I want to get around and tell you the uh, the uh, mission timer down in the LEB when Ron went down there to uh, get things squared away. It was about 15 seconds or so behind uh, all the other clocks. Roger, we copy that. Okay, and uh, we reset it, uh, resynced it, and it's uh, been running okay. I don't know whether that's a clue to anything or not, but uh, apparently it happened either during launch uh, or somewhere before we got down there, right after insertion. Okay, uh, we're going to lose you here in about nine seconds. You're a go and looking great, and we'll work on it, and if you get another MEB, will you check the LEB for us? Yes, sir. Sure will do, Bob. We'll see you. What's our next day, OS? Stand by. Uh, Carnarvon at 225. Thank you. This is Apollo Control, Apollo 17 now over the, the horizon from the uh, Ascension site. We'll be reacquiring in about 25 minutes uh, through Carnarvon. And as you heard uh, Capcom Robert Overmeyer advising the crew, uh, we've been getting a good look at all the data. And uh, spacecraft launch vehicles uh, look fine. Uh, no discernible problems. Uh, Gene Cernan did mention uh, one anomaly, and that was the mission timer. Uh, one of the uh, one of the numerous clocks aboard the spacecraft, which was running about 15 minutes slow, 
and Cernan said it appeared that it uh, happened either during the launch phase or shortly before they got down to take a look at it in the lower equipment bay. No explanation for, uh, for that one at this point. And we show now uh, one minute, or one hour rather, uh, 11 minutes until ignition for the translunar injection maneuver. The burn with the Saturn third stage that will place Apollo 17 on, on its uh, trajectory toward the moon. Uh, ignition time uh, still holding at about uh, 3 hours, 12 minutes, 35 seconds ground elapsed time. And that burn will be about uh, 5 minutes, 45 seconds in duration. Uh, we don't have the final calculated time from the flight dynamics officer, which will undoubtedly vary somewhat from the uh, uh, pre-mission flight plan time. At uh, 2 hours, 2 minutes, this is Apollo Control, Houston. This is Apollo Control at 2 hours, 25 minutes. Apollo 17 now approaching the west coast of Australia. And we'll be uh, reacquiring the spacecraft uh, in about 35 seconds. Uh, during this pass over Carnarvon, uh, we expect to pass up the first set of numbers to the crew that they'll use in the translunar injection burn to put them on their trajectory towards the moon. Uh, that maneuver is scheduled to begin at uh, 47 minutes from now. And we have uh, acquisition of signal a little bit early. 17 Houston, how you doing? Well, we're pretty good. You're uh, wavery to hear a little bit on signal strength. Okay, uh, we've got a TLI pad. Anytime you're ready to copy it, Jack. Goodness, okay, let me get rid of something here. Right, I'm putting that right underneath you. And guys, we'd like to and accept, please. You're okay. getting a CSM state vector if you'll give us poo and accept. Got poo and accept. Okay, let me have my favorite pad. Okay, here's a TLI pad. Time base 6 at 3-0-2-5-7-1-8-0-3-1-2-0-0-0-5-5-1. Delta VC is one zero three five nine or six three five five eight two zero 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 three four five zero four zero extraction will be at three zero zero one six five three two zero three one two zero Three zero six zero five seven one zero. Yaw is zero. Ejection time four plus three niner plus zero zero. Over. Omni Charlie. And it's your computer and you've got your state vector. Okay, you got Omni Charlie. And Bob, we had almost a completely weather free pass over Africa and Madagascar. And uh, the scenery, uh, both uh, aesthetically and geologically, uh, was something like I've never seen before, for sure. Uh, Roger. We got odds and ends on the tape and uh, quite a bit on the film. Roger, good show. You're saying that you didn't have any weather over uh, that southern Africa there? Not 
not very much. Uh, barely broken clouds in some places. Uh, most of the countryside was clear. Uh, Roger. There were uh, patterns uh, like I hadn't even seen in textbooks. Uh, maybe I haven't been looking enough, but uh, some of the desert and uh, grassland patterns were uh, had the appearance of ice crystals almost, except on a mega scale. If you uh, ever looked at ice crystals in sand. Roger. Or better yet, ice crystals on your car window when you uh, uh, get out early in the morning up in the northern areas. Uh, Roger. And uh, just be advised, uh, we'll be uh, standing by for the go, no go for Pyro Arm when we get to Hawaii, and we'll be giving you a go for TLI about that time. Okay, and we'll be ready. And uh, Ron, on the launch checklist on uh, 2-25 on the manual and nominal S4B TLI-1, add 34 degrees on the nominal pad for all the pitch angles, and on the manual pad, add 34.5 degrees to all the pitch angles, and you'll have it right. Okay, Bob, give us a Do that on your cue card also, Ron. Yeah, that's a firm. And we're about ready to LOS. We'll see you at Hawaii. Okay, Bob. Uh, we'll Two plus we'll five zero at Hawaii. Okay, five zero, and we'll be uh, into our TLI checklist, and uh, we'll be ready for the fire arm. Okay. This is Apollo Control. We'll be reacquire, reacquiring the spacecraft in about 18 minutes. And during that pass over at Carnarvon, uh, we passed up the numbers to the crew they'll use in the translunar uh, injection maneuver. Uh, the uh, uh, burn is uh, targeted to uh, last five minutes, 51 seconds, uh, with a change in velocity of uh, some 10,359 feet per second, uh, accelerating Apollo 17 to the uh, required speed to get it into an orbit that will intercept the moon. And the uh, time of ignition, uh, 300, uh, 3 hours, 12 minutes, 35 seconds. And we're showing uh, an ejection time uh, four hours, 39 minutes. The trans <coughs> transposition and docking uh, maneuver, which precedes ejection, uh, is somewhat fluid in that it's done uh, when the crew and mission control are ready uh, following translunar injection. However, from the uh, uh, projected time for ejection, uh, it would appear that transposition and docking uh, will occur about 25 to 30 minutes ahead of the nominal flight plan time. And we're now 39 minutes away from the scheduled ignition for translunar injection. At 2 hours 34 minutes, this is Apollo Control, Houston. This is Apollo Control at 2 hours 49 minutes. We're standing by now to acquire uh, radio contact with Apollo 17 through Hawaii. Uh, during this Hawaiian pass, we'll be getting another good look at uh, spacecraft and launch vehicle systems. Uh, the last look we had uh, through Canova, everything looked very good. Flight Director Gene Kranz uh, going over the status with his flight controllers. Uh, observed that there appeared to be uh, no problems that would uh, interfere with TLI, and we'd expect to have a normal translunar injection about uh, 23 minutes from now as Apollo 17 
uh, completes its stateside pass and moves out over the uh, Atlantic Ocean at the start of its third revolution. Hey, Houston, this is Apollo 17. Go ahead. Hey, Ron, you're sounding great. Uh, good boys here. Oh, yeah, we got things uh, all set up here, and uh, we're kind of standing by for a logic check uh, whenever you guys uh, can give us a go. Roger, as soon as we get some TM in here, we'll give you a go. Okay. 17 Houston, we're ready for the logic check. Okay, Bob. Uh Houston, you're about one minute from LOS, and we'll pick you up at Goldstone at about three hours and zero zero minutes, and that's only a couple minutes prior to time base six start. Okay, Bob, we'll be with you. Roger. Bob, that glow is actually above the horizon, just in case you're curious. I can see uh, stars uh, below the uh, top of the globe, down uh, closer to the Earth. Roger, Jack. Houston, we're with you again, and you're looking good. Okay, uh, mighty fine, Bob. And, Bob, we've got the pyro's arm now. I'll register. And you could expect some different Omni calls as we go uh, LOS and AOS again. Okay. Always expect that, Bob. A Roger. Omni Delta, please. Okay, you've got it. Roger. I'll just switch, uh, Bob. I won't give you a call. Roger. Subway was out on time. Roger, Dean. This is Apollo Control at three hours, four minutes. We're now some eight minutes away from ignition. Uh, everything looking good for the translunar injection maneuver. The combined uh, S-4B, the Saturn third stage, and the spacecraft uh, with an orbital weight of 308,298 pounds uh, at the start of this maneuver. I'll check, Bob. 
17 Houston, go ahead. I'm uh, just checking with you. Uh, you're so quiet down there, we almost forgot you're there. Oh, Roger. Don't want to forget me. We're just watching everything. We can't find anything wrong, so we're just trying to keep quieter. Okay, Bob. Uh, we're watching the F4B tanks pressurized. Roger. Down is in progress and the tank pressures are looking good. Okay, Bob, looking good here. 17 Houston, you are go at uh, three minutes prior to ignition. You're looking good and you're gonna we're gonna have a, a riot coverage all the way through the burn until the session. Roger understand, Bob, 5710, our deal operate. And we're coming up now on two minutes until ignition. This burn again will be a five minute, 51 second uh, maneuver. The uh, S4B engine uh, delivering about 225,000 pounds of thrust. And it'll be increasing the spacecraft velocity from the current uh, uh, speed of about 25,000 feet per second up to around 35,585 feet per second. Roger, we confirm it. Step line on at 3-6. All right, dear. And booster reports the uh, ullage engines are on. This is to settle the propellants in the uh, S-4B prior to ignition. Uh, we're 53 seconds now from ignition. Final status check here, and you're go for TLI. Twenty seconds now to ignition, and uh, we're maintaining communications with the spacecraft through one of the Araya Apollo range instrumented aircraft. Roger. Ten seconds. Copy the crew reporting S4B ignition. That's confirmed uh, by the telemetry. And booster reports the thrust looks good on the S4B. 17 Houston, you're looking good, and the thrust is go. Bob, you're done, but we're go on board at 20 seconds. Roger. And telemetry data from the Saturn instrument unit shows the velocity increasing up uh, now to 26,000 feet per second, beginning to climb ever more rapidly. This burn was initiated at an altitude of about 97 nautical miles above Earth. Uh, when finished, the spacecraft will be at about 150 miles above Earth and on its way to the moon, some 213,000 nautical miles away. Roger, Jim. We can barely hear you through the Araya, but you're go. Uh, very weak voice communications, and Booster says the uh, data is now static. But at last, uh, look, everything looked normal. Seventeen, you said we can confirm PU shift, and you are go. And 
That was Capcom Robert Overmeyer confirming to the crew that our data showed the uh, Saturn uh, shifting its uh, propellant utilization for uh, most efficient utilization of the propellants. Then 2.30, uh, in the vine, we're still go. Roger, 17, you're go, looking great. Okay, Bob, well, got that. To understand we're going from the ground, and uh, it's a good ride, although it's rumbling around a little bit. Okay. Coming up now, three minutes into the burn, and the velocity approaching 30,000 feet per second. Three minutes, uh, and we are go. Roger, Gene. Bob, we're going to TLI right through sunrise. Right to understand. Jane Cernan reporting the uh, TLI burn has taken them out of darkness and into sunrise now. And we're showing a velocity of 30,463 feet per second. Roger, 17. Apollo 17, now about 107 nautical miles above Earth, and continuing to climb ever more rapidly. Four minutes, 30 seconds now, and everything continuing to look good. Apollo 17 at a velocity of 32,000 feet per second. At 4.30, you're still unreadable. Roger, how do you read me? You are go, by the way. Okay, we got you that time. Understand we're going to ground. We're still go here, and we're TLI and right through at sunrise. Understand. Five minutes now, less than one minute to go. And Booster Engineer reports uh, we're very close to the nominal uh, predicted shutdown time. Seventeen Houston, your burn time is nominal. Roger, understand burn time now. And Shut down now in about 21 seconds. We're showing a velocity of 33,000 feet per second. Altitude now approaching 150 miles. We don't have the disky. Uh, you have to read it to us, uh, uh, Ron. Okay, uh, VI is, uh, I got a zero zero and a zero zero and a 995. VI is, uh, three five five seven three. Is a plus nine. And, Bob, uh, the EMS is minus, EMS is minus 19.4, minus 19.4. Roger, we copy that. And it was an auto cutoff, auto cutoff on time. Understand, a guided cutoff on time, looking great. And I'm watching the tank pressures are venting, the tanks are venting. Understand, tanks are venting.
And we're still getting communications through the Apollo range instrumented aircraft. We'll be uh, uh, picking up through Ascension shortly, at which time we'd expect the communications to improve, the noise to drop off. Uh, from Gene Cernan's uh, report, also from the reports from uh, Ron Evans, it appeared that that uh, translunar injection was extremely close to nominal. Uh, the crew read a cutoff time of 5 minutes 52 seconds. The uh, pre-maneuver prediction was 5 minutes 51 seconds. And the cutoff velocity appeared to be very, very close to the uh, planned normal. Booster engineer Frank Van Rensselaer reports the booster cutoff appeared to be exactly normal. Booster engineer uh, uh, predicting that the maneuver to separation attitude will begin at about 3 hours, 33 minutes, 27 seconds. your VI and your EMS numbers, and uh, we've got a number for you. The maneuver start time will be at 3 plus 3, 3 plus 2, 7. Okay, we got you. Maneuver at uh, 3, 3, 3, 2, 7. That's affirmative, Jack. You guys didn't tell us we couldn't see anything going through the sunrise. <laughs> Roger. 17 Houston, uh, we're making plans here for a spacecraft SEP time of 3 plus 4, 3. Thirty minutes. The flight dynamics officer has just reported that uh, initial tracking uh, following the translunar injection burn uh, shows the spacecraft to be on a very nominal trajectory and a relatively small mid-course correction uh, indicated at this time. Uh, the pre-burn prediction on that uh, first mid-course correction was around five feet per second and uh, we expect that that will be uh, updated as we get additional tracking following the burn. In about three minutes, the spacecraft should, uh, the launch vehicle, should be uh, begin move maneuvering to the uh, proper attitude for separation, and uh, we're predicting separation to occur at about three hours, 43 minutes, or about uh, 13 minutes from now.
right, six five for the L and B's uh, mag November, November. About ten seconds now until the Saturn third stage begins maneuvering into the proper separation attitude. Booster engineer reports uh, from telemetry data that the uh, booster has begun maneuvering into the proper attitude for spacecraft separation. Okay, we uh, we are maneuvering, Houston. Roger, we're watching it. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of big ones out my window down there. Just bright. Looks like the 4th of July out Ron's window. Yeah, now you can see some of them in shape. They're very uh, jagged, angular uh, fragments. They're tumbling. Right, they look like fluid of some sort? Not to me. They look like pieces of something. Uh, Roger. They're very bright. Jack, we'd like Omni Charlie. Bob, for the most part, uh, these fragments are not, uh, well, are tumbling at a very slow rate. I've tried a couple pictures of them uh, at different settings. Uh, you may get an idea of what uh, at least the patterns look like. Roger, I got you. We're all ears on these fragments if you think you can figure out what they might be. Well, you know, I, I don't know. There are a number of possibilities. Uh, if you had some kind of a... I got the impression maybe they were curved a little bit as if they might be uh, uh, off the side of the S-4B. Uh, that's a wild guess. Uh, okay, RCS uh, logic is... Uh, ice chunk, possibly. Uh, maybe there's paint coming off of it. Right. I noticed on one trip up the elevator last week, uh, one of the flags, I thought it was in the S-2, but it might be on the S-4, looked like it was peeling. Maybe that's what you got. And the S-4B maneuver is complete. Okay, was it the old clock? Okay, Houston, and the, uh, with the maneuver complete, the fragment field is uh, essentially static, except for very slight tumbling within the fragment. Roger, copy that. Every once in a while, a fragment of considerably higher velocity than the others goes uh, across my window, but that's very rare. Roger. Hey, that's that uh, field of view I saw on my window. Jack, can you see it now? Yeah. And Bob, uh, at least there, there's no apparent relative motion between fragments. I do understand. I'll take uh, two pictures about uh, a minute apart if I can, and it'll be frame 70. Okay, frame 70. And Bob, uh, Gino, my impression is that they are uh, uh, flat, flake-like particle, some uh, maybe uh, six inches across, and uh, although there's no relative motion between the two, uh, most of them seem to be uh, twinkling, and I think for the most part they're all moving away from us. 
Roger, Jane. Thank you. Logic is closed, six armor closed, logic power is on. Seventeen Houston, you have a go for candy. Okay, a go for candy. Apollo 17 now in the process of uh, turning around uh, after having separated, blown the pyrotechnic charges that separates the uh, spacecraft from the Saturn third stage. Roger, bet you never saw the slaw panels on the simulator. No, but we've got the booster and is she pretty? Challenger's just sitting in her nest. Or Roger. We like Omni Bravo now, Jack. Okay, we'll uh, plus 
Roger, we're standing by for it, and the angles as published on L3-3 should be good. How do you read? We don't have a very good knock, uh, lock on here in React. Uh, Roger, Jack, we're reading you uh, pretty good. Uh, voice. Okay, it looks like it's improving. It dropped off, uh, signal thing dropped off, and now it's uh, picking up again. Uh, Roger. We're getting good signal now, uh, Jack. Jack, the high gain is look good. I'm guessing, I don't know, about 100 That's feet, maybe. Good news. Seemed to smooth, uh, slew very smoothly, so uh, looks all right. Roger, Jack. And one right, too. Evans now at the controls of America, uh, moving in for the docking with uh, Lunar Module Challenger. And uh, while we're moving in here, I can see a few uh, chunks of that uh, plating material, uh, possibly paint, down in the slot, sort of bouncing around between the uh, S4B and the uh, limb. Roger. So far, uh, Lynn looks very clean. Uh, can't see anything uh, 
Abnormal from this view, yes. Okay. Isn't it though? That thing is really stable out there. Got one little uh, chunk coming out, just came out of the slot and uh, spinning uh, along a long axis and looks very stable. Roger. Every once in a while, uh, a small particle flies off of it, though. How big a chunk are you talking about, Jack? Say again? How big a item are you talking about? About the same diameter as the thruster on the limb. Oh, Roger. That's how long it was, and about uh, oh a fifth that thick or that wide. Oh, Roger. And I don't think it, I don't think it was more than a quarter of an inch, uh, maybe even less uh, thick. Uh, that same particle. Uh, Bob came by, and as it was spinning, it was throwing off pieces of itself uh, radially out. All right, do we have any? There's small ones come flowing by. They look like flakes. And I think I caught three of the four slop panels going uh, as we were maneuvering. I've got one out the hatch window now. It's uh, quite a ways out. Roger. Uh, tumbling in all three axes. And uh, I saw the fourth one uh, out my side, so we saw them all. The area around the uh, two spacecraft is uh, cleaned up pretty well by now. They were just few fragments moving around. A crew of Apollo 17 describing what uh, would appear to be paint or uh, possibly ice uh, flaking off the uh, Saturn third stage, uh, but somewhat uh, puzzling at this point is just exactly uh, what the flakes or particles that they're, they're describing might be. And Apollo 17 uh, in the
process of uh, docking with the lunar module, uh, preparatory to extracting the uh, LEM uh, from the Saturn third stage. Uh, this occurring at some 5,300 nautical miles from Earth. And we're watching the spacecraft velocity uh, drop off rapidly as that altitude increases rapidly. Uh, the velocity which at uh, the translunar injection cutoff was around uh, 35,000 feet per second down now to about 22,000. Roger, Jack. Can you see down on that quad? Is, it, is that how you're looking at it? Yeah, I'm looking right at it. And I've got a good view of uh, the Mesa top anyway. It's pretty well covered, but it uh, looks all right also. Roger. All the antennas look good. Thruster quads all look great. I could see all four of them a minute ago. Okay, about 10 feet there, Gene. Stand by for uh, up on the barber pole. Capture Houston. Roger, we copy. Okay, we're free. Uh, rates look pretty good. Let's plug it together. Ready. She's uh, lined up, not bad. Okay. Uh, prime one. Mark it. Stand by. There she comes. saw your master alarm. Did you have any uh, anything on the matrix of light up? No, not a thing. I looked. Roger. That would appear to be a repeat of the uh, uh, master alarm uh, that has been reported several times previously by the crew. Uh, they get the alarm light and tone, but uh, when they look for the uh, exact indication, or the precise indication of what's wrong, it's not there, uh, indicating some sort of a uh, uh, spurious response by the uh, master alarm to uh, a problem that doesn't exist. Okay, Bob, we're going to go ahead and take a look at that uh, docking malfunction before we press on to further and check this uh, barber pole out. Roger, we're working some words up here. Uh, we'll be back within a second on the chain. Okay, we're down at a checklist uh, through the these power breakers uh, open. I understand. And usually, in case we didn't tell you, it's talk back A that's uh, verbal. I understand. Uh, we have it.
say, uh, 17, we don't think it's a problem. Uh, we'll find out what it is when we get in. We think we should just press right on with the flight plan checklist and keep going. Okay, uh, we concur with that. Okay, we'll press on, Bob. Okay, Bob, we just got a master alarm when I went to the uh, retrack uh, prime from one to off. All right, we can copy that. Looks like panel two is jinx up there, huh? Okay, O2 heater number three went to auto. All right, do we copy that? Okay, Bob, we're reading the delta P of uh, greater than four, and I'm going to open the pressure equalization valve now. Roger, 17, we copy that. Okay, the delta P's coming down, Bob. Roger. Jane, while you're watching that, I just thought you'd be interested. We talked to some of our friends down at the Cape who watched the launch, and they said you were a glow all the way until you faded into it. You couldn't tell you from a star. They saw staging, and uh, they could just see you as a star way off in the distance until you faded out. Not a cloud in the way at all. Yeah, well, okay, we're at, uh, we're at two, and we're monitoring it for three minutes. Okay. And uh, Houston, while we're checking the integrity here, a mag uh, alpha alpha, uh, there's about 50 percent. Mag alpha alpha, 50 percent, right here. This is Apollo Control at four hours, 12 minutes. The crew aboard Apollo 17 at this time pressing ahead with their uh, preparations for uh, separating. The uh, lunar module and command module now docked together uh, from the Saturn third stage. Uh, you heard some conversation earlier about uh, an indication that uh, all of the docking latches uh, had not locked up. Uh, there are 12 of these latches uh, in the docking mechanism, six of which are instrumented. And of the six that uh, are instrumented, uh, there was an indication that one of those may not have latched. However, uh, we are confident that uh, more than enough latches have uh, locked up to assure a good solid dock, and for that reason the crew is pressing ahead uh, with their preparations for uh, separation. The uh, delta P change is less than 0.1. Three minutes and less than 0.1. We are pressing on. Barrage press. And that report from uh, Gene Cernan indicating that uh, they have a good seal uh, at the docking interface. Once the uh, hatch is removed between the uh, two vehicles, the crew will get a good look at uh, all of those docking latches and uh, we'll be able to tell uh, how many, if any of them, uh, didn't latch up. Pushing ahead now for a uh, uh, for extracting the lunar module, separating from the Saturn third stage at uh, ground elapsed time of four hours thirty nine minutes. Uh. Okay, what well, cabins are four eight now? Repress is about empty.
Yeah, it's all the repress will do. We'll turn that off. Okay, Houston, the uh, repress uh, package uh, is empty now, and we're down to a dollar P of point two. Uh, do we copy that? And uh, 17, just be advised, you're going to have an S4B non propulsive vent start at 41827. You get about three minutes on that. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I'll get him. Okay, Bob, uh, we seem to be holding uh, Delta P at about point two. I suspect that's probably zero. Roger, we copy that. Yeah, the cabin <laughs> pressure is about 4.5. You want us to uh, wait till 5 PSI for the uh, emergency cabin uh, pressure selects? Uh, negative on that. Let's go ahead and just press on. Okay. This should be both. Okay. Emergency racks are working. Advise you don't have to wait till 5 psi cabin to go ahead and open the hatch. Okay, we're not, Bob. We're pressing on with it now. All right. Okay, it looks like we're going to maintain about 400 on the surge. Go ahead. Uh, seven. Okay, seven. 
9 and 10. Uh, the handle is flush. Uh, the bungee is vertical. But uh, the handle is not locked down and the, uh, and the red button uh, is showing. And I can uh, pull each one of them back slowly. I haven't done anything with them. That's 7, 9, and 10. Roger, we copy that. The handle is flush, the bungees are vertical, but the handle is not locked down, and the red button is showing on 7, 9, or and 10. That's for. Okay, Bob. Uh, Bob, I just pushed the handle on 10 uh, home a little bit, and it did lock, and uh, the red button is flush. So that leaves me 9 and 7. Roger, understand? Jano, uh, go ahead and try the handle on uh, 9 and 7, and if that doesn't work, cock them and refire them, starting with 9, please. Okay, the handle uh, doesn't work. I'll have to recock them. Okay. Dribble with your, with your uh, cock it twice. Yeah. And it took two cocks to, uh, to uh, make it go. Okay. Okay, nine cocked twice and tripped. It is over center and locked. Roger. How about the barber pole now? Okay, wait a minute. I've got plug and probe main A circuit breakers in and going to retract, and it's gray. Okay. Ah, I did it. Roger. And okay, Bob, uh, cocked seven twice and uh, tripped it, and it's over center and locked. Roger. I think that takes care of them all. Good show. Okay. Okay. Pocket probe circuit breakers are out and extend retract is off. Bob, the umbilicals are connected. All right, sir. Okay, Houston, uh, 7 Delta on the test meter is now reading 1.0. It jumped up to 2.6 and is now back to 1.0. Roger, we copy. That's good. This is Apollo Control at 4 hours 30 minutes. About 9 minutes from now, the uh, crew will be firing the pyrotechnic charges that separate the lunar module docked to the command module from the Saturn third stage. And uh, Springs will uh, push the LEM CSM uh, back away from the launch vehicle at a rate of about one foot per second. Then uh, at uh, ground elapsed time of four hours, 52 minutes, the uh, launch vehicle will yaw to the proper attitude for uh, an evasive maneuver of about 10 feet per second to be performed at a ground elapsed time of about five hours, three minutes. Uh, this will increase the separation distance to assure uh, no chance of recontact between the booster and the spacecraft en route to the moon. On removing the uh, a uh, hatch between the LEM and the CSM, uh, allowing the crew to get a look inside the uh, docking tunnel. Uh, they found that three of the 12 latches had uh, not locked up, but on manually uh, recocking them and uh, uh, activating them, uh, they latched up properly, which indicates that uh, there's nothing physically wrong with the system. And uh, we would expect that the next time uh, the two vehicles come together to dock that uh, uh, the latches will function properly. Pretty good apps, okay, Bob, the hatch is back in. Roger. 
Roger, Dean. 17, Houston. Go ahead, Houston. All uh, right, we got some uh, new new angles here for you. Stand by a minute. Let me find a place to copy them. What uh, what kind of angles are they, Bob? They're your uh, now 22 attitude uh, maneuver for Asperger out of the hatch window. Uh, the middle of page uh, L3-5. Oh, okay. Instead of 270, we want 274. Uh, wait one, we're not quite with you. Okay. Okay, uh, I think I marked you 3-7, go. Uh, it's on 3-5, Jack, in the middle of the page there. Those now 22s. Okay, I take it back. 3-5, middle of the page. Okay, you notice there's three angles there. 270, make that 274. Okay, that's the only change. And the no, the next one, the 129.8, change that to 164. And the 4.3 on the yaw, change that to zero. It's close enough. Zero on the yaw. Okay, we got them. 274.164.00. Roger, and uh, the high gain angles that you got in the flight plan are close enough and should do it. Good. Telemetry data now shows the crew loading the uh, information into the spacecraft digital autopilot in preparation for separation from the Saturn third stage. That should be occurring in the next uh, minute or so. Uh, we'd like to just verify on that top line, S4B slash LEM, SEP, circuit breakers, both of them are closed. Okay, uh, we'll verify them again. We double-checked them. Okay, we just didn't hear your call. We want to make sure that, didn't want to miss anything here. Okay, they are, uh, they are verified. 
Right, uh, closed, inject, just check them again. Okay, you are go for pyro arm and go for extraction. Okay, go for pyro arm, go for pyro extraction. Or limb extraction. <laughs> My mark, as for me, Lamp will come on. Okay, then I'll back it off to the... Okay. Okay, on my mark, as for me, Lamp Sep. Three, two, one, mark it. Okay, we got it. Oh, man, did we? There she comes. Yeah, Lem came with us. Okay, where's the MC Auto? I don't know. I've got uh, six tenths, it's all right. Okay, what do you do? Uh, safe the barrels. Okay, logic's off. Arm breakers are open. This is Apollo Control. Uh, America and Challenger are on their own. Uh, lab ejection occurred at 4 hours 45 minutes, ground elapsed time, at an altitude of 13,000 nautical miles from Earth. camera and pad camera off.
Roger, we have that. We're standing by for your go for our yaw maneuver. Roger, thank you, 17. Looks like she came out of there clean as a whistle. 17 use on the yaw maneuver will be starting in uh, about 4 plus 5, 2, a little less than 2 minutes from now. Okay. I'd like to take a picture of that old dome out there, huh? Yeah, I'm gonna restart it. The Saturn third stage now uh, maneuvering into attitude uh, for the APS evasive maneuver, 10 foot per second burn using the auxiliary propulsion system that'll assure. The flare for the dramatic, but it certainly did its job for it. Roger, Jack. Data indicates you're about as nominal as you can be. That's the way we'd like to keep it, Bob. You better believe it. Okay, she's, uh, as we're looking at it, she's pitching up. Uh, she was looking right at us. We were looking right at the dome, and uh, now she's pitching up. The uh, shroud around the IU seems to be totally intact. Uh, it, it looked like a super clean separation. Uh, I can't really see where there's any paint or anything externally uh, chipped off the, uh, the booster from here. We're beginning to, uh, to pick up the bell. It's really a shame you don't have this, uh, this whole thing on TV. It's really quite a sight. Roger, we concur with that. The uh, mylar and their gold coating on the inside of the uh, shroud that's now visible is... Uh, also intact. It looks like you could use it again if you could get it back. Well, it's got a job to do when it hits the moon yet. Okay, Bob, we've, uh, we're almost looking at it broadside now. Roger. Okay, she's spitting a little. Looks like the yaw maneuver may be complete. We got a uh, full view of the uh, entire J2 from here. And uh, no kidding, Bob, the, uh, the whole bird, uh, the shroud at the top by the IU, the separation plane uh, down by the S2, uh, from here all looks as clean as a whistle all the way. Roger, uh, Gene, if you're happy, we'd like to uh, go from you for the evasive burn. OK, 
Okay, you're going to burn uh, on the boosters plus the X axis, is that right? That's affirmative. Let us get a picture or two here yet, and uh, we'll give you a go. And Jane, uh, it'll be about seven minutes till the base of burn, five plus O three. Okay, you have a go. And for your reference, uh, at frame uh, one O five, I started a few uh, 250 millimeter pictures of the S4B. Okay, Jane, and Bob, the uh, entire uh, sky, as far as I can make it out uh, through the hatch window, is uh, completely filled with our uh, twinkling flakes. Roger, we can be that. I saw a couple uh, particles go by the window uh, a while back, and it looked a little bit like uh, insulation in this in that particular case. Uh, styrofoam uh, insulation, but in flat flakes. Roger that. That was uh, right after uh, we uh, separated from the S4B. CSM uh, CSM Roger. CSM Roger, and Bob, I know, uh, I know we're not the first uh, to discover this, but uh, we'd like to confirm from the crew of America that the world is round. Roger, that's a good data point. I, have you... Uh, Gotten a good look at any of that weather down there on the Antarctic? Well, on Ron's window number one, maybe he can tell you a little bit about it. You know, it's uh, real funny there in Antarctica. The, you can see the snow, but there isn't any weather at all on it. All the weather's around it in the water. All right. That's where the moisture is. Seventeen Houston. Go ahead. Looks like you've got a super conservative CMP up there. We've uh, run out some numbers. Looks like you used about forty pounds of RCS on the T and D, and you've used about a total of forty-two pounds RCS total. So we're hanging right in there. Beautiful. Very fine. Glad to hear that. Good. A velvet touch. Oh, a little bit uh, too much, but that's not bad. We'll be glad to uh, leave all that extra, I hope, uh, in the service module when we get home. Then the uh, Volkswagen pouch down there. Uh, I'll chase Lens now. 17 uh, Houston, it's about 30 seconds from the base of Maneuver Burn. There it goes, Bob. There it goes, finally. Roger. 
is Apollo Control at five hours, five minutes. The burn is complete, and the lock stump will be at five plus two four plus two zero. Okay, five plus two four plus two zero. Roger. Bob, you can tell Frank to forget to uh, return in that phone call I made to him a couple days ago. Roger, understand. All my questions are answered. I think you've had enough booster briefings, huh? Yep. I figured this was probably the best one of all. Frank said he'd guarantee all his S-4Bs would be just as good as this one. Okay, that's fair enough. The S1C and the S2 didn't put on a bad show either. That's right. Uh, Houston uh, Magazine, uh, November, November is on uh, about 123 right now. Okay, uh, Ron, Magazine, November, November is on 123. Sounds like a winner, Gene. Okay. I guess you saw that one, Houston. Uh, that had no uh, caution or warning with it. Roger, right, is that a master alarm? Yes, sir. How about the LEB? Gene's got Sing in. <laughs> you caught me. Forgot to look. Keep after us. We'll get you that data point. Roger, Jack. Uh, Gene's got his hands all over panel two, which probably is what caused it. Jack, uh, we think that might have been a real one due to the accumulator cycle uh, with the O2 makeup flow going on there. It gave, held the O2 flow higher than for uh, greater than the 16 seconds. Well, that's certainly a possibility. Uh we didn't notice it uh, looked up right at the time, but it, uh, sure that was the right time? Well, he kind of was watching it here, and it's, uh, he feels it is. Gee, I can't argue with him. Okay, Houston, uh, ready to deactivate the primary evaporator if you concur. Roger, Jack, we concur. Exactly where it is too well. Oh, Roger. 
Uh, could we get a readout on the LIM uh, CMWP? Plus point four. Roger, we copy that. Bob Antarctica is uh, what I would call effectively just a solid white cap down on the uh, South Pole. Uh, there's a definite contact between uh, the continent and the water. But as Ron said, uh, most of the clouds uh, seem to be uh, all very artistic, very picturesque, some in uh, clockwise uh, uh, rotating uh, fashion, but appear to be very thin where you can, for the most part, tend to see uh, through those clouds uh, to the blue water below. With the, uh, the, con the continent itself is, is the same color as the clouds, but of course more dense in a striking uh, difference than any of the other white background around because uh, you can definitely see that contact uh, uh, with the water and with the clouds over the water. Right to understand. It's going to be a calm switch over to Madrid here shortly. We may break lock a few minutes here, or a few seconds really. And uh, you might watch your accumulator is going to cycle in about 20 seconds here and see what happens on the master alarm. Houston, how do you read through Madrid? You're loud and clear, uh, Bob, and uh, could you give us our uh, distance from the Earth, please? Uh, Roger, I'm looking up at the board. I'd guess about 19,000 miles, but let me get it exact. Uh, just approximately. 18,100, uh, Fido says. Okay, and uh, I suppose we're uh, seeing as. Uh, 100% full Earth as, uh, as we'll ever see, certainly as I've ever seen. Uh, it appears to be, it may be uh, a little bit, uh, a little bit of a terminator uh, way out to the, uh, well, to the east, out beyond uh, Australia and beyond India, but beyond that, it's about 99% pure. Well, but these kind of views that uh, these kind of views that stick with you forever. Roger, team. We've got a. Uh, I guess probably the continent of Africa dominates uh, the world right now. It's covering the uh, uh, oh the upper uh, third, uh, upper and uh, western third of. Uh, of the world, we can see the Sinai, we can see up into the Mediterranean, we can see across the Mediterranean, although we can't quite make out uh, the countries up there, we can see across into India, I can catch a glimpse of uh, Australia out on the uh, far horizon, we've got uh, Zanzibar in the southern tip of Africa, the Cape down there just uh, almost directly below us, and uh, I don't know exactly how big uh, Antarctica is, but I guess we can certainly see more than 50% of it. And uh, the rest of it is all oceans, the Indian Ocean out into the Pacific Ocean and back into the Atlantic Ocean. And uh, uh, for the most part, relatively clear clouds, except uh, in the Antarctica region. And uh, up towards Europe, uh, which, is, uh, which is on the horizon, across the Mediterranean, it looks like there uh, might be some clouds uh, back up in that way. I can probably, probably, uh, well, not probably, I can make out the uh, entire coast of Africa from, uh, from Mediterranean around to the west, coming back to the south, uh, back where it takes this big dip to the east, back around the Cape, back around up through the Suez Canal, uh, almost perfectly. How do we understand? And there's one uh, batch of clouds uh, in northern Africa, just a small batch, it looks like it may be up near the, uh, 
Well, no, it's not near the mouth of the Nile. It's uh, quite a bit west of that, as a matter of fact. Uh, I can see the mouth of the Nile. I can see it running straight down towards us as a parallel to Suez. And uh, then sort of fades out into the uh, central uh, darker brown or darker green uh, portions of Africa. Roger, Jane. Sure be nice to have that on TV, wouldn't it? Oh, I'd love to give it to you any way I could. You know, and there's no strings holding it up either. It's out there all by itself. Roger. I just was uh, going through the uh, 17 status report uh, on CSM systems, and uh, boy, everything is absolutely nominal with the exception of those uh, glitching master alarms that uh, we're trying to still track down, but every other system is just nominal. It's Everything's great. Okay, sounds good. That's the way they build it for us. Gene, looking at our plot board, you're uh, directly over the southern tip of Africa, or just slightly out in the Indian Ocean there, according to our plot board, which isn't exactly accurate all the time. But uh, shortly, you're going to start going backwards on the Earth here and head back across the Atlantic. That ought to be some sort of a, of a first. You cross the Atlantic uh, twice going from west to east, and then now you're going to cross it going from east to west here shortly, all in a very short span of time. Yeah, I guess that does sound like a first. This is Apollo Control at 5 hours, 30 minutes, ground elapsed time. The white team of uh, flight controllers headed by Gene Kranz is in the process now of handing over to the team headed by Flight Director uh, Pete Frank. Uh, after 12 hours, the uh, team came on uh, about three hours prior to the scheduled launch time of uh, 8.53 p.m. Central Standard Time. Of course, launch occurred uh, two hours, 40 minutes late at a ground elapsed time of 11, or at a Central Standard Time, rather, of 11.33 p.m. Uh, as a result of the uh, late launch time, the translunar injection, uh, events up through translunar injection, uh, also slipped two hours and 40 minutes. Uh, we would expect that uh, the translunar injection, which is targeted to make up the difference, will get us back on uh, the nominal flight plan time uh, by the time the spacecraft arrives at the moon. In other words, uh, arrival time at the moon would be at the same central standard time as called for in the flight plan at about 1.49 p.m. central standard time, December 10th. But the ground elapsed time uh, would be about two hours, 40 minutes earlier than uh, that provided for in the flight plan, uh, with the arrival being at about 86 hours, 14 minutes ground elapsed time. The uh, two hour, 40 minute uh, difference uh, being accounted for in a speedier arrival time at the moon, a translunar injection burn uh, being targeted to be just slightly longer than uh, would have been the case in a uh, normal launch. And uh, the spacecraft uh, getting to the moon in a total elapsed time, two hours, 40 minutes less, uh, in effect making up the lost time uh, from the late launch. In order to get the flight, flight plan uh, back in agreement uh, with the ground elapsed time, the GET, or ground elapsed clocks, will simply be moved ahead uh, two hours, 40 minutes, uh, between now and the time uh, spacecraft arrives at the moon, so that by the time uh, Apollo 17 is uh, inserted into lunar orbit, uh, the GET will once again agree with the flight plan GET, and of course the uh, uh, central standard time of arrival uh, will be the same as was originally planned by virtue of the speedier uh, trip time. 
As a result of the late liftoff, uh, it was not possible to uh, program television coverage of the transposition and docking. Uh, this was because of a shift in the uh, orbital ground track, moving the uh, ground track away from the needed uh, manned spaceflight network coverage for television. Uh, we simply didn't have an adequate ground station to receive the television signal from the spacecraft. There has been one uh, uh, recurring problem that is yet uh, is unexplained. That is in the displays and control system. Uh, the crew reported on several occasions that uh, master alarm was occurring. Uh, the master alarm uh, manifests itself uh, in the form of a light that flashes in the uh, command module. There are three of these lights and also a tone that comes on. And uh, the normal procedure is when the master alarm uh, light comes on and the tone sounds, the crew then looks at another matrix of lights to determine precisely where the problem is. Uh, however, uh, when looking at this uh, matrix of lights, uh, none of them were lighted, indicating that some spurious signal had uh, ignited or lighted the uh, master alarm light, and that there was, in fact, uh, uh, no problem in the, uh, in the systems. There is, at this point, no uh, explanation for the problem. However, uh, engineers here in the control center are looking into the past history of panel two, uh, which is the, uh, the panel on which a number of switches are located, uh, which have triggered this uh, master alarm, to see if there is a history of panel two that uh, uh, would indicate uh, a possibility of some momentary short in the caution and warning system, which could give a master alarm. The problem at this point is uh, an annoyance, but uh, uh, does not appear to be a serious problem. All other spacecraft systems are performing uh, normally, and the uh, trajectory uh, to the moon is almost precisely as, as uh, planned at this point. We do not, do not anticipate a uh, change of shift uh, press briefing. Uh, the uh, white team will be coming back on uh, at the regular uh, central standard time, uh, 4 p.m. tomorrow. And in light of this uh, rather short turnaround, we're going to forego the change of shift uh, press briefing. At uh, 5 hours 36 minutes, this is Apollo Control, Houston. Bob, uh, I have a first uh, hit of uh, contamination on window 5. It's coming probably the central, uh, well, I'd say uh, roughly a rounded square, about uh, 7 inches in, uh, on a side. Uh, with a very thin film that's catching the uh, sunlight. And uh, slightly iridescent, but uh, also very finely granular. Very finely granular. You just barely tell what it is. Then. I do understand. Looks like very uniform in thickness right now. Uh, Bob, this uh, Jack is. We uh, got a uh, NCPA dump uh, scheduled or as possible at 6 o'clock. There's nothing sacred about that time, is there? Nothing at all. Whenever you're ready, just go ahead and dump. Okay. Bob, well, one of the things that uh, we miss in our training is a good geography lesson. And particularly uh, on uh, Antarctica. I got the monocular out, and apparently the dark band that Gene uh, Ron mentioned, uh, the interface between the continent and the water, is that between the uh, pack ice and the water, and you can, by uh, very uh, subtle changes in the apparent smoothness of the ground, 
probably make out where the actual continent begins and the back ice in. There are a few uh, exposed uh, ranges. I guess it's uh, midsummer down there now. And uh, you can make out the snow free uh, areas scattered, uh, at least in the uh, northern portion of the continent. Raj, uh, did you get any pictures of that, Jack? Oh, yeah, we got some pictures earlier. Uh, I'm going to get another one here in a minute. I'll tell you, if there ever was a fragile appearing piece of blue in space, it's the Earth right now. Roger. And we got a master alarm. Okay, we copy that. And there's one in the LED. Okay, good data point. And there are no caution lights. Uh, it came right at an accumulator cycle along with the high O2 flow again. Uh, yeah, yeah, I just checked the time and I think you're right on that one. Well, we gave you your LED data point. Yes, sir. problem with uh, looking at the Earth, uh, <laughs> particularly Antarctica, is it's too bright. Understand. And uh, so I'm using my uh, sunglasses through the monocular, which is not the best uh, viewing platform. Uh, I think uh, I can see uh, some of the areas of the dry valley, but uh, again, I'm not too sure of my uh, geography, uh, Bob. There are clouds uh, over the continent, I believe, uh, but of course they're just as white as the snow, and you only see differences in texture brought out by uh, probably uh, varying uh, photometric uh, return because of fairly low sun angles down there. Roger. But you can see patterns of uh, what I believe is pack ice uh, leading off uh, from that uh, sharp interface that uh, was talked about earlier. And those patterns seem to uh, merge directly with the patterns of the clouds as if the uh, uh, at least near the continent, the uh, oceanic currents are controlling the uh, air currents uh, up to a point along with the movement of the pack ice. Rudder. I'm, I'm distinguishing the pack ice from clouds mainly by uh, uh, the angularity of the patterns within them. Uh, there is no good, clear uh, color or albedo distinction, so uh, I couldn't. I couldn't be looking entirely at clouds, but I suspect there are some pack ice patterns too. I'm not keeping you awake, am I, Bob? No, sir, just keep talking. Uh, we're listening, and I'm sure not much of the world is listening, but this will all be recorded. You can uh, read it all when you get back and think it through, tie it up with the pictures, and uh, I'm sure there's going to be people interested in this. And yeah, we're interested in ourselves. Just keep talking. All I want to do is read what I say. Right. If I had a little more geology training, I'd be asking you some better questions. Uh, right now, I can't think of any to ask you. Well, I can't. Uh, I really wish I knew that geography. I don't know. I wish I thought of bringing a, a good uh, map of Antarctica. Uh, could uh, somebody do a little researching for me and... Uh, and see if they can tell me if we uh, have a uh, little American view, say, on the eastern uh, edge of the continent. Right, we'll see if we can get some uh, Antarctica geographers around. Yeah, I'd like to, and also whether or not they think the Dry Valley area is visible to us. Uh, let's see, there's some, uh, some of the people over there in uh, Bill Benny's group. I think uh, have a little Antarctic experience or used to, and uh, they might be able to help you out. Okay, we'll see what we can track down on it. Don't uh, use up a lot of people's time on it, but... Uh, Roger. It's getting pretty empty around here. It's 5 in the morning, so... Okay, uh... Uh, 
there is a good, strong uh, northern hemisphere uh, cyclone uh, up near India, and I think Gene mentioned that. It, uh, I think, uh, was one I saw in some of the forecast sheets uh, as a dissipating uh, hurricane or uh, typhoon. I'm not sure which it is there. I guess it's a typhoon. And I see something here that I noticed in Earth orbit, Bob, that as you approach the Terminator, and now I'm looking at the uh, uh, Eastern Terminator. Got to keep all my directions straight here. Yeah, Eastern Terminator. Uh, the uh, clouds, uh, those associated with the uh, uh, cyclone over uh, India and one that uh, appears to be due south of there, uh, maybe 30 degrees of uh, latitude, uh, have a gray appearance. The, uh, instead of the brilliant white of other clouds, as you approach the Terminator, those, uh, at least the high level clouds are gray. Now, uh, when we were going over them in orbit, the lower level clouds were still white, and I think I can see a hint of that right now. That the sun uh, uh, gives uh, strong white reflections off of the uh, buildups in the low level clouds, whereas the high level and uh, relatively uh, layered uh, cirrus and uh, maybe some of the intermediate level uh, stratus uh, tend to look gray because of the grazing sun, I suspect. Right. You, uh, you mentioned something in Earth orbit that kind of intrigued me. You mentioned seeing the uh a rainbow, and we were trying to figure out how you saw a rainbow up there, and you were in orbit already at that time. Do you remember that? Well, uh, we're not. We were speaking of the uh, appearance of the uh, sunrise. Okay. Having right. a uh, uh, having a, a banded color appearance uh, that uh, varied as you approached sunrise. Uh, I can't remember uh, what. We did, I think we put some of that on tape, uh, and we were probably uh, LOS at the time, but the banded uh, character of the uh, sunrise uh, in the atmosphere was very, very marked. Uh, there a, was a gray, blue uh, upper layer that merged uh, or graded into a brilliant uh, blue uh, intermediate uh, zone that was just above the, the cloud level, and within the clouds uh, you got uh, a orange uh, to yellow uh, band, getting more yellow as the sun rose, uh, that was broken by the uh, dark patterns uh, of the uh, buildups. Roger, good show. The interesting thing was the continual glow on the horizon uh, we had even at night uh, on the dark side path, and uh, that glow was in the atmosphere it, uh, because I could see stars uh, rise uh, over the uh, horizon in it and then uh, pass on through it. Uh, so we were talking the uh, the air glow, I guess, is a phenomenon most of the guys have seen before. It's kind of interesting, guys. Yeah, it's, uh, that's right. It's, uh, it's a I guess standard air glow, but it, uh, it is it is very striking that it's a continuous thing, even in the uh, dark Roger. past. Uh, I think I just see uh, the uh, eastern tip of South America now. Right, you're uh, starting to back up now, uh, coming coming the other way. So uh, you're still over Africa, according to our chart here, but you're backing up towards the uh, South America. Yeah, I can see the uh, part of uh, South America that Megan uh, thought fitted into the uh, the bend in Africa some many decades ago, and uh, started people thinking about uh, moving continents around on the crust. Roger. Uh, Jack, how how the uh, PGA doffing goes? Most of you are you all out of the PGAs now? 
That's been work. Uh, we're taking it slow and easy up here, Bob. Roger, understand. I'll just be curious to see if they all fit in that bag. Yeah, I think you'll find that uh, Ronald Evans will also be curious about that. He's already made some comments. Roger. This is Apollo Control at six hours, as Jack Schmidt gives the description of the Earth. Apollo 17 is 22,868 nautical miles from Earth. Velocity 12,520 feet per second. Certainly do have a very clear uh, intuitive impression, uh, although the evidence is hard to pull together, that the uh, any frontal uh, systems that move off the Antarctic continent uh, do not take on any uh, well-defined character until they get into the moist regions of the ocean. And when they do, they seem to pick up an arcuate uh, cir circulation uh, that, uh, in the view we have, uh, seems to get fairly regularly spaced cyclone uh, patterns uh, that lie between uh, uh, Cape of Good Hope and the northern portion of Antarctica. And these, uh, the cir circulation of the cyclone uh, follows uh, roughly an east-west pattern, and the curve, the arcs of the fronts are uh, more north-south, let's say uh, northwest, uh, swinging around to the south. Uh, Roger. All of all up very, uh, very nicely defined uh, as uh, southern hemisphere cyclones. There are uh, about four of those visible uh, swinging around. Uh, oh, I guess that's latitude. Uh, I'm having to guess here, but I'd say latitude uh, 50 to 60 south. Okay, 50 or 60 south, then. Yeah, I'll have to look at the map here in a minute and see if that puts me uh, between Antarctica and the Cape. Roger. Well, the tip the tip of Africa there is at uh, about 32 south. Well, that uh, sounds like a pretty good guess. It? it looks like the intertropical convergence uh, zone over Africa is starting to get more and more clouds in it now. Uh, I suspect it's midday approaches, which is what we're seeing there. Uh, we can expect to see more and more uh, moisture uh, indications. Well, is there, uh, they're probably about noontime right there right now. It's 11.36 at the zero meridian there at, at Greenwich, so it's uh, just a little bit before noon right in that area you're talking about. Yeah, some of those masses of what uh, I suspect are cumulus buildups, uh, well, not really. They don't look like they're as concentrated and localized. They look more like uh, just uh, masses of fairly uh, dense clouds that are developing in that band of green that crosses the uh, lower portion of Africa. Roger. Stay tuned for the next installment on the Earth. I'll uh, try to get out of this suit. Okay, just take it easy, Jack, and uh, we'll be listening. Man, I've never taken it so easy in my life. I'll tell you, Bob, uh, I couldn't have believed this would be an experience like it is now. Roger. Yeah, every time you turn around, there's something else to see and wonder what's causing it, whether it's a particle zipping across the window or uh, one zipping across the cabin. Our uh, spring mechanics here in the <laughs> zero G, there's always something going on. Roger. This is Apollo Control at six hours, seven minutes. No mid course correction number one will be performed. The value of uh, the maneuver that would be required is less than three feet per second. And mid course correction number one will not be performed by Apollo 17. The spacecraft is now 23,682 nautical miles from Earth, velocity 12,301 feet per second. 
Bob, uh, by not waking you up as an observer from another planet, certainly uh, probably could decide that we uh, have such things as uh, clouds and uh, at least uh, large uh, thunderstorms. Because right at the Terminator, you get uh, brightening of the sunlit side and a uh, long, long shadow out to the uh, out to the east uh, that is uh, reminiscent of what we uh, saw in the early days uh, looking at the moon at the Terminator. Uh, Roger. However, the next pass around, I'll bet you you wouldn't see him. I've never been a big, uh, I, didn't, well, I didn't grow up with uh, the idea of drifting continents and uh, sea floor spreading, but I tell you, when you look at the way the pieces of, uh, of the uh, north, uh, northeastern portion of the African continent seem to fit together, separated by narrow gulfs, it could almost make a believer of anybody. Roger, it's beginning to look like a globe that you might buy down at the store, huh? Oh, I don't think so, Bob. Okay. I don't think we better put this one up for sale. Somewhere there might be somebody who'd like to buy it. Hey, Jack, uh, we noticed the O2 flow has dropped down now. Uh, we're running. Did you all close the waste storage vent valve? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, let me check on that. It might have gotten closed inadvertently in this uh, game we're playing down in the LED. Right. Uh, Ron says it's still in vent. It is on vent, Roger. Okay, we're noticing the flow is coming back up slowly, so something causes it to drop and uh, it's coming back up. Okay. 17, Houston. Go ahead. Uh, Jack, just to ease those words I said before, we looked at the schematics here a second and uh, you'd be dumping urine out of that same line as that waste vent and that would uh, probably cause the pressure to build up enough to slow the uh, the O2 flow and we know the O2 flow is climbing back up to where it belongs. Well, that's clever. Okay. Didn't mean to worry you there and shouldn't have said it I guess before we looked at the schematic. Well, I really hadn't started to worry about it yet, Bob, so uh, no sweat. How'd the S-4B uh, work go, Bob? I just finished uh, their second burn, and it's targeted right where they want it. Just working perfectly. Where were they going to put that one? I guess I uh, lost track of that. Seven degrees south and eight degrees west, Jack. Uh, say again, uh, you cut out on the first. Okay, uh, seven degrees south and eight degrees west. Okay. That ought to be interesting. This is Apollo Control. It six hours 24 minutes the s4b maneuver that was just being discussed was performed with the auxiliary propulsion system just completed uh, delta v of 13 feet per second to tune up the trajectory for s4b impact at the desired location on the lunar surface of seven degrees south eight degrees west that's approximately uh, 200 kilometers east of the Apollo 14 all site, where a 
seismometer is located. That impact is expected to be picked up by the other uh, seismometers on the moon, the other Apollo lunar surface experiment seismometers. Booster Systems Engineer is now maneuvering the uh, S-4B stage, the third stage of the launch vehicle, to a solar heat control attitude. This is to minimize the heat into the instrument unit. Uh, they will then track the stage for a considerable length of time and determine whether another uh, corrective burn will be required. At 6 hours 25 minutes into the mission, this is Mission Control Houston. This is Apollo Control at 6 hours 27 minutes. Booster Systems Engineer has just reported to the flight director that the S-4B stage uh, is in good shape with 14 hours lifetime remaining. The limiting factor on the uh, S-4B is the battery life. 14 hours of battery life remaining on the S-4B. Hello, uh, Houston, how do you reach CDR? Read you loud clear, uh, Gene. Okay. Bob, uh, Alan P's going off the air for a little while. Roger, Jack. Sound like a sigh of relief. No, sir. I've been enjoying listening to you. Keeping up, keep me awake down here. You had a long day. Not as long as you've had. I've just been lying around, floating around. Hey, you make it sound so good. Piece of cake. I'll talk to you in a little while. Yes, sir. This is Apollo Control at 6 hours 34 minutes. Apollo 17 now 26,553 nautical miles from Earth. Velocity 11,606 feet per second. see anything at all on main A down here. We did have an accumulator cycle again. I uh, don't know if that ties in or not. Yeah, the main A undervolt, uh, I just have to be looking right at the uh, panel on the main A undervolt. Uh, light blinked on for a second. And of course, uh, obviously, main A is up now. Roger. Ron Houston here. Uh, we've checked the back room and the high speed charts and that, and don't see any glitch on main A at all uh, on our data down here. Okay, Bob. This is Apollo Control at 6 hours 49 minutes. Apollo 17 is 28,200. 32 nautical miles from Earth, velocity 11,291 feet per second. Uh, we're continuing to operate at present on the uh, normal GET of the flight plan, normal grand elapsed time. Under that schedule, the crew's rest period uh, will begin about nine hours and uh, 15 minutes into the mission. Uh, if, however, the crew uh, completes the activities uh, that are scheduled in the flight plan uh, early, uh, the rest period will probably begin early if they so desire. 
However, at the present time, we are continuing to operate on the GET of the flight plan. At 6 hours 50 minutes, this is Mission Control Houston. This is Apollo Control at 7 hours 7 minutes. Apollo 17 has just passed the 30,000 mile mark on its journey to the moon. Now at 30,039 nautical miles, velocity continuing to decrease. Now 10,932 feet per second. Roger, we copied that one. We saw it. Uh, just about ready to call you when you called us just now. This is Apollo Control at 7 hours 15 minutes. Astronaut Bob Parker is now relieving uh, astronaut uh, Bob Overmeyer at the Capcom console. And the commander of the backup crew, Captain John Young, has just left the control room. He has been sitting at the Capcom console with uh, Overmeyer since returning uh, from the Cape uh, early this morning. So the next uh, Capcom voice you will hear will be that of Bob Parker. This is Apollo Control at 7 hours 34 minutes. Apollo 17 now 32,000 697 nautical miles from Earth, velocity 10,457 feet per second. The crew a little over midway in the scheduled uh, meal period in the flight plan. Houston 17. Uh, Roger, Code 17. Yeah, that uh, little master alarm there, uh, I can't be absolutely positive, but out of the corner of my eye, I think it was the uh, two compressor light that uh, glitched. Okay, we copy that. Uh, you, we believe down here it was a high O2 flow. Well, they're pretty close. Uh, I thought it was red, and I thought, it, okay, that's good. That's the right time, I guess. Okay, because we had just called it out. Uh, I was just ready for you five seconds before you called me. Very good, Doctor. Roger, and Tony is back in Houston on the console. It's hard to believe. What are you doing back here? We're, we haven't even had time to go to sleep. Let me tell you, it's a tale It's hard to believe. It's almost as miraculous as your escape from the pad tonight. Did you enjoy the launch? Beautiful. One night launch, seen them all, huh, Parker? We go to SCS. Yes? Okay. Never know if this is it or not, but we're trying. Stuff whipping all over the place. Yeah, there's a star in there. Copy that, November, November, and 130. And uh, Houston 17, uh, you copy the torque and angles now. Roger. Goodbye. Yeah, okay, we have him, and you're going to torque him. This is Apollo Control at 7 hours 58 minutes. 
Ron Evans is realigning the inertial platform. That uh, was scheduled on the flight plan for uh, eight hours, uh, 15 minutes. That indicates they are running 15 to 20 minutes ahead of the flight plan. Jack Schmidt is obviously uh, taking some pictures. Uh, he gave Bob Parker a report on the film magazine that he was using. Did you see rest mat? Uh, in 17, we have a preferred rest mat standing by. If uh, you want to give us accept, then we'll send it up before you do your second P-52. Okay, uh, you have to put an accept now. Uh, Roger, understand we have about data. It's coming at you. And, Ron, while we're sending it up to you, we'll also send you an update on the zero trunnion biases for the flight plan. Okay, mighty fine. Okay, uh, 17 run, uh, you can go to block now, you've got your PTT reps mat, you're free to do uh, P-52 option one if you want, and uh, if your eyes were suspicious from time to time, you may have an open mic there. Okay, uh, thank you. Okay, uh, Houston, uh, those are the differences in the gyro target and all target. Uh, oh, 11, I guess. 8, 11. Okay, copy that. Uh, this is Apollo Control at 8 hours, 12 minutes. Apollo 17 now 36,353 nautical miles from Earth. Velocity 9,878 feet per second. Apollo 17, Houston, over. Go ahead. Uh, Roger, we've been discussing uh, the question of what your sleep configuration is going to be in terms of headsets or not, particularly with reference to all these spurious master alarms. And I guess we'd feel better if one of you guys slept with his headset on. We we're curious as to what your plans are. if we were trying to get hold of you to put the klaxon up, but we're a little uh, un in favor of that because of the possibility of one of these spurious things waking everybody up that way. Yeah, I'll go ahead and keep it up and see how it works out for a while. Okay, we copy that. And when you guys are ready, we have a couple of, uh, we have three items to read up to you for the updates in the flight plan. Okay, the first one's in the flight plan itself, and it's the quads for the uh, PTC spin-up, and they'll be Alpha and Bravo. Okay, for PTC spin-up, quads, Alpha, and Bravo. All right, we just took that back. It should be Bravo and Delta for spin-up, Alpha and Bravo only for damping. Copy Bravo and Delta for spin-up, Alpha and Bravo for damping. And 17, if you have that, I have two others. Uh, one, the flight plan supplement book, and the other one's in the GNC checklist. Okay, go with the supplement. Okay, in the flight plan supplement, we have an e load update. It's on page 1 43. Say 1 43. You can give me a call when you get to that page. Okay, Bob, uh, I'm there. 
Okay, under line, that's 30704, column Bravo, you find currently 33550. And let me give you a word of warning. When we change this, we'll be changing it again around 67 hours. These are uh, primarily due to the uh, launch delay. And we'll give you another GET update of this sort uh, later on. The uh, new number to replace uh, three. Bob? Go ahead. Uh, let me get a pencil, please. Uh, okay. Use that instead of a pen. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, under, uh, again, I remind you, 30704, column Bravo, which was 33550, is now 34761. The line just below it, which is 05, also in column Bravo, is 15403. Over. Okay, Bob. For uh, 30704, Bravo 34761, and for 31005, Bravo 15403. Okay. Very good. And the next one's in the GNC checklist under the P37 uh, block data. And you have to find out that's on page 4 23. Okay, uh, go ahead. Okay, on the uh, liftoff plus 15, be the first uh, block. It's 01500 3893 minus 174 05756. The second block uh, for liftoff plus 25 is zero five, pardon me, start over again there, zero two five zero zero six six five one minus one seven five zero five seven two five, over. Okay, uh, Houston, Paul 17. First one will be uh, zero one five zero zero. That'll be uh, 3893 minus 174, and GET 400K is uh, 05756. Another one is TIG of uh, 02500. That'll be uh, 6651, longitude minus uh, 175. GET of 400K is 05725. Uh, Roger, good read back. Bob, uh, <clears throat> Jack, I'm going to be uh, moving into the pre-sleep checklist here. Uh, are there any uh, things you want to uh, change or alter in that? And are you ready for the waste, waste storage vent to be closed? Uh, Roger, uh, 17, we're ready for the vent valve to go closed, waste storage vent to close. And we have no anticipated changes at present time in the flight plan, Jack. Okay, I'm just looking at uh, 1-29, the pre street checklist, and uh, uh, wondering if there was anything there. Stand by, Jack. Okay, uh, 17 for antenna management tonight. We'd like you to select Omni Bravo at the current time and stow the high gain antenna and uh, we'll take care of managing your antennas from here on. Okay, we'll give you Omni Bravo and stow the high gain. Okay.
And Jack, uh, we indeed do not have anything to add to the pre-sleep checklist tonight. Okay, uh, Jack, I guess as you, we're not quite sure what you said or meant there or what, uh, what it is. In the, in the flight plan itself, we want H2 heaters 1 and 2 to auto, and we want H2 fans on tank 3 only to auto. The 3 there is for H2 tank 3. Okay, you're teaching me to read carefully early, aren't you? We're trying. So one and two heaters will be in auto, and three fan will be in auto. That's the way it is now, and uh, consider the fans have been cycled. Roger. According to the checklist. Look at the uh, third line on uh, 1-29 and look at the uh, H2 line on the flight plan and see why I was confused. Uh, Roger, we were just discussing whether or not there was a fan or fans in each tank. That ought to keep you awake this morning. Can I take something? What I was really trying to do, Bob, is get out of chlorinating the potable water, but you wouldn't bite. This is Apollo Control at 8 hours 28 minutes. Apollo 17, now 37,832 nautical miles from Earth. Velocity, 9,667 feet per second. Apollo 17 crew in the uh, period now in the flight plan where they're making preparations for their rest period, getting the systems uh, in the proper configuration for a sleep period. The spacecraft has been maneuvered to the passive thermal control or PTC mode attitude rather and uh, just prior to the rest period the crew will uh, spin up the spacecraft uh, for uh, thermal control during the rest period the uh, spin rate will be slow approximately three revolutions of the spacecraft per hour but it will keep the uh, thermal balance on the spacecraft. At 8 hours 30 minutes, this is Mission Control Houston. Uh, Apollo 17, Houston, over Jack. Go ahead, over Bob. Okay, uh, we're going to give you a little uh, high-gain antenna uh, practice here. 
We'd like to pick up with the high gain antenna again so that we can uh, get your uh, PTC or can watch your PTC develop. We'd like you to go to pitch of 40 and yaw of 275 on the high gain. That's 40 pitch, 275 yaw, and manual and wide. Over. And you want the high gain selected, I presume. Oh, that helps, too. Yes. You got it. Uh, Roger. Our, our apologies. Well, I don't expect that'll be the last time you have to apologize. I think we're running about even now. You're missing quite a view, Bob. Sorry you're not here. That makes two of us. Well, I just said that makes three of us. What are you trying to tell me? Look out. Who's your uh, friend off on your right tonight? Wally Moon, would you believe? Say again? Wally Moon. Oh, a Moon, huh? Why don't you ask him what he's reading at H2 tank 3 quantity? Okay. I'm asking him. In percent. Okay, uh, 17 on uh, tank 3 of H2. We're reading 84 decimal 38. Okay, it looks like we're reading almost the same nowadays. I thought we launched with a little bias, but I guess that's gone now. We're a little higher then. And 17 Houston, we're seeing your rates uh, quite low enough to start to spin up the PTC. Okay, we'll see if we can't get it right this time. That means still the high gain after you stu after the startup. We'd like to watch the startup itself. Okay, I'm just going to ask you when. Okay, 17. We're ready for high gain uh, to stow and select Omni Bravo. Houston, 
we gather you're ready for sleep almost. Uh, one thing we'd like to check at the end here is your O2 heater configuration, over. Okay, go ahead, Bob. Roger, can you give us your O2 heater configuration? Okay, we've got uh, one and two in auto and three is off. Okay, we'd like those per the flight plan, one and two to off and three to auto. Okay, one and two to off and uh, three to auto. Okay, and do you have a uh, final change or update on the film status beyond that 130 that Jack gave us? Yeah, my one. This is Apollo Control at 8 hours 55 minutes as the crew of Apollo uh, 17 prepares for a five and three quarter hour rest period. The spacecraft is 40,165 nautical miles from Earth, velocity 9,349 feet per second. Copy that, Gene. And uh, Alpha Alpha, that 16 millimeter mag, uh, has about 25% uh, left. Okay, copy that as well. And I guess uh, as soon as you change the Lyo canister, if you have or haven't, and uh, charge battery Bravo. Then we're ready for you to sleep at your leisure, configuring your comm, remember, the uh, squelch enable and the voice off, and you get ready to go to sleep. Roger, Apollo 17, we copy the film update, and uh, we're ready for you to go to sleep. Uh, uh, once you've got the uh, Lyle canister changed, uh, if you haven't, and uh, remembering also the uh, charge on Brady battery Bravo. After that, it's just the uh, comm configuration, squelch enable, and voice off when you get ready to go to sleep. Bob, you cut in and out. Stand by. We'll talk to you Okay, I think we're losing an army here.
This is Apollo Control at 9 hours 12 minutes. Apollo 17 now 41,677 nautical miles from Earth. Velocity 9,159 feet per second. The spacecraft has stabilized into a passive thermal control mode now. Uh, is completing one revolution every 18 minutes. This is Apollo Control at 9 hours 26 minutes. The booster systems engineer has advised Flight Director Pete Frank that a second mid-course correction for the S-4B, the third stage of the launch vehicle, uh, will be required. This uh, maneuver is performed with the auxiliary propulsion system of the S-4B and the booster systems engineer will command this burn at 11 hours, 15 minutes ground elapsed time. Uh, the magnitude of the burn is not known at this time. Uh, that will be determined uh, shortly before the uh, mid-course is performed. Purpose is to uh, tune up the trajectory uh, to more precisely target the S-4B stage to the desired impact point on the lunar surface. Uh, tracking uh, to this point of the spacecraft indicates that uh, a mid-course correction will probably be performed uh, for the spacecraft at the scheduled mid-course correction number two time of 35 hours and 30 minutes. Uh, preliminary look, this is a very early look, uh, shows it to be about 10 and a half feet per second, but that will be refined as uh, we get closer to the time. At nine hours, 27 minutes, this is Mission Control, Houston. This is Apollo Control at 9 hours, 30 minutes. We've had no voice communications with the crew for uh, some time now, but we do have indications that they have not yet fully configured the spacecraft for their arrest period. Normally the voice switch is, is turned off. Uh, that's the last step before the arrest period. That voice switch is still on. Apollo 17, uh, now 43,261 nautical miles away from Earth. Velocity 8,964 feet per second. This is Apollo Control at 9 hours, 48 minutes. From the data that he is receiving, the flight surgeon, Dr. Sam Poole, uh, reports that he believes uh, the spacecraft commander, Gene Cernan, is asleep. Uh, Cernan is the only uh, member of the crew who is wearing the biomedical harness during the rest period and therefore it's the only one that uh, flight surgeon is getting measurements on. But the indications are that uh, that Cernan is asleep and apparently the uh, entire crew has gone to sleep. Apollo 17 now 44,749 nautical miles from Earth. Velocity 8,794 feet per second. The awake clock uh, 
is operating in the control center shows wake up for the crew in 5 hours, 10 minutes, 37 seconds. Be one of the most proud moments of my life, I guarantee you.